climate change impacts and adaptation at Scripps. Uh, so a strong interest in sea level rise and coastal flooding issues. And I'm also here representing the Coastal Processes Group at Scripps, which is involved in a lot of basic and applied research uh, looking at coastal flooding in Southern California. So uh, similar to the majority of coastlines around the world, the U.S. West Coast is expected to experience a considerable acceleration in the rate of sea level rise in coming decades. And I think the main motivation for this workshop is that we want to ensure that we're as prepared as possible for the challenges ahead. Uh, both in identifying, observing, and modeling needs, as well as ensuring that the best science is available to all communities in need. Uh, we'd ordinarily host this at Scripps. That was the original plan. Um, and I, I'm sorry that that couldn't be, but certainly one benefit in holding this virtual workshop is that we have an amazing uh, group of attendees. The, the, this would be very hard to replicate this uh, audience in any other format. So we're excited to see what this discussion leads to. The uh, uh, workshop was sponsored by a, a, a large group. It's, uh, it's uh, Ocean Visions meeting, as I mentioned. Scripps is a sponsor. Uh, the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, SCOOS. California Sea Grant, uh, the Northwest Association of Networked Ocean Observing Systems, NANUS the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System, CENCUS, um, the Washington Sea Grant, University of Washington, Oregon State University, uh, NOAA Climate Services Center, uh, Pacific Region, and Georgia Tech. And we had a outstanding uh, group of uh, committee members to organize this. I just wanted to call out Clarissa Anderson from SCUS, Roxanne Carini from University of Washington, Laura Ingeman, who really put this all together from California Sea Grant and Scripps, John Mara, uh, NOAA Regional Climate Services Pacific Region, Ian Miller from Washington Sea Grant University of Washington, Jan Newton, the Northwest uh, from NANUS, Peter Ruggiero from Oregon State University and Henry Wolf from uh, Sankus. So this, as I mentioned, is a part of a series of uh, workshops uh, sponsored by Ocean Visions. And to give you an understanding of what that's all about, I'd like to introduce Mano um, Di Lorenzo. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you for putting all this together. Uh, so my name is Emanuele Di Lorenzo. I am a professor at George Tech and currently serving as, a, as the chairman for the Ocean Vision, uh, which is an initiative that started at several US institutions, including Scripps, uh, Stanford, UCSB, and others on the West Coast, to try to transform science and engineering into practical ocean solutions. And as part of this effort of trying to bring in science and engineering back into solving real problems, uh, one of the themes that Ocean Vision has identified is that of uh, coastal solutions. And so as a first round, uh, this workshop that you guys are participating today is part of uh, actually a set of three workshops that are essentially going on each coastline. So we did the US East Coast uh, you know, last year, uh, there's this one on the West Coast going on today, and there's another one that will take place for the Gulf state uh, next month uh, as a way to sort of collect, you know, uh, experiences and case studies and, you know, from different coasts of the U.S. and hopefully come up with a more integrated and synergistic way of working together. And, uh, and this uh, sort of synthesis work will happen actually uh, in May uh, at the Ocean Vision Summit, which is also held at Scripps. And at that summit, there's a session that I think Mark is also co-chairing on coastal solutions. So I hope that uh, I wish everybody uh, great work and productive work, and uh, we'll see what will come out of this. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And thank you, Laura, also. Fantastic. So I'm going to get us started with just an overview of today. Um, so we have, this is a two-day workshop. Uh, today we'll be going till 2.30 and we do have a lunch break. I'm gonna just share my screen really quickly uh, again on the agenda. Everyone can see that. Um, so we have a couple of really great keynote addresses to talk a little bit about the uh, national policies around coastal flooding um, and coastal flooding research. Um, um, uh, Acting Assistant Administrator LaBeouf and Director of the U.S. IOS Program, Carl Goldman. Um, we'll be sharing some videos uh, that I really appreciate all of the folks that submitted case studies so we can have an idea of what's happening along our West Coast. 
And these are sort of broken down into three different types of um, observing, modeling, forecasting, and predictions. Uh, so we're talking a little bit about uh, how we monitor floods today, uh, what types of fl uh, short-term flood forecast um, tools and solutions that are available now, and then also what um, evolutions and long-term projections um, and scenario analysis type of modeling are out there. In addition to that, we'll be hearing from a, a selected panel of um, community perspectives, talk a little bit about how several locations along the West Coast um, are experiencing flooding today. Some of these are more vulnerable populations or underserved populations and how we might be able to work together to provide communities like these with additional resources to address flooding. Uh, we'll also be doing a little bit of uh, sprinkled with a little bit of getting to know each other and potential collaboration. So I'll uh, be asking you guys to fill out a couple of online polls and questions to help us get some feedback from you. And then if you're going to join us on day two, we will be talking about some collaboration and integration opportunities um, with Mark Osler from NOS, Nadia Vina Gradova from the NASA Sea Level Change Team, and Julie Rosati from US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and then we'll be doing some breakout groups. Um, so I'm ex really excited for this agenda. And um, I just want to give you a sense for kind of who's here. I think we have like 135 participants. So it's growing. It keeps adding. Um, as I talk to you, I don't know if you can see that workshop participant slide. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so this just gives you a sense for who's in the room today. So we do have quite a mix in terms of geographic location, uh, people coming from uh, both California, Washington and Oregon, which is fantastic. Um, other US, meaning folks uh, from other parts of the US, but a number of folks from the Washington DC offices. And then we have a lot of um, international uh, modelers and um, researchers that have joined us today, so welcome. Uh, we have about 20% of the folks uh, registered today are from federal entities, so USGS, Army Corps, FEMA, um, and the different NOAA line offices. And then about 80% are actually from regional and local, either academic universities, um, consulting agencies, city or state community um, stakeholders. And then in terms of specialties, uh, most of the folks on the phone uh, were more than one, uh, marked more than one specialty. So a lot of folks are working in both coastal observing and modeling and predictions, or might be doing modeling and predictions and providing technical assistance to communities. And a number of folks are also involved in developing actually the stakeholder, the end user products with the um, with the modeling information or observing information. So um, quite a nice mix, a lot in the modeling sector, but um, a pretty, pretty rounded group. So I'll we'll take that back and show the agenda. Um, let me stop sharing really fast. Okay, so uh, just a couple of really sh small logistics before we get started. Um, you guys are all muted, but we are in Zoom meetings, so you can um, can't unmute yourself, but I ask that you just actually use the chat box for your questions. Uh, we have so many folks on the on the meeting today that it's a little hard for us to uh, manage anything but the panelists answering questions. So go ahead and use the chat box, submit questions during any of uh, the presentations or the videos, and then we'll be monitoring that chat box and helping to uh, feed some of those questions to our panelists or case study leads throughout the day. Um, if you want to rename yourself in the participant box, you can rename yourself and add a comma in your institution or entity so that folks know where you're coming from, which might be helpful for collaborations. Um, we are being recorded and the recording will be showing online after the workshop and the case studies videos will stay up on the website and will be um, shared with the East Coast and the Gulf States case studies, uh, as Manu mentioned at the um, 
uh, highlighted at the um, May summit for OC data. And I think that's about it in terms of logistics. I just really look forward to hearing from you all. And I'm so glad that so many of you could participate. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to kick us off for our keynote speakers. Okay, we have two keynotes. Uh, we're very, um, it's a pleasure to welcome Nicola Buff, the Acting uh, Assistant Administrator for NOAA's uh, National Ocean Services. Uh, and she'll start us off with a federal perspective on coastal flooding. Hi, Nicole, I think you're muted still. Ah, there we go. Can everyone hear and see me? Yes. Excellent. Okay. You always have to ask. Got to ask. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, good morning to everyone there on the West Coast. Um, I really appreciate being able to be here with you today, even if it's just uh, to welcome you to your workshop and to provide you with a bit of the national perspective. I wish I could stay longer, but I have a very busy schedule, as you might imagine. It's full of good things, I assure you. Um, as you've probably noticed, we've had a busy couple of months. Uh, for me in particular, I will say that in addition to my ongoing role as the Acting Assistant Administrator of the National Ocean Service, I've also been asked to help uh, NOAA Acting Administrator Ben Friedman and the new policy team coordinate cross NOAA activities as well as to represent NOAA and the department in several high-level bodies and interagency meetings as the administration continues its transition. These engagements include topics like climate change, 30 by 30, coastal resilience, coastal infrastructure, uh, environmental justice, uh, familiar topics to all of you. In fact, later today, I will be participating in a high-level meeting on coastal resilience uh, across the federal agencies. So these are really exciting times. Uh, we are busy. Um, but it's it's all good stuff. Um, it isn't surprising to me actually that this administration across the federal agencies is engaging in all of these issues, particularly associated with climate change. Um, it just seems like everyone is responding to the president's all of government um, approach um, to climate change, sea level rise, coastal flooding. These are all global problems. Um, they threaten our national security and our local communities. Um, so like it or not, we're all going to have to prepare for the changes ahead. And um, this group doesn't need to be told that. Um, they also need, you also didn't need to be told that uh, climate is impacting our uh, coasts and ocean um, faster than most anywhere else on the planet. As sea levels continue to rise, damaging floods that decades ago only happened during a storm uh, now happen more regularly, including in communities along the West Coast whether it is uh, associated with the January 12th storm that led to severe erosion along Washington's coast or sunny day flooding in the Newport Beach area last July. You all are feeling the impacts of a changing planet already. The conversation that you're having over the next couple of days comes at a timely moment. And as the new administration and Congress put renewed emphasis on understanding the impacts of climate change, they are asking a lot of questions about sea level rise. The workshop that you are participating in this week will help uh, identify opportunities, both those that NOAA and others within the federal family can undertake, as well as those of our partners, uh, many of which you will lead. It's important that we have continuous and sustained engagement with the folks that you work with daily, like managers, planners, and stewards throughout our efforts. And that's because decision makers need the information that you have to do their jobs, well, at least to do them well. And I look forward to hearing more about the outcomes of this dialogue, the case studies um, about inundation modeling and observations along the West Coast and your final conclusions. I hope that your work will help us all identify integration gaps and evolving opportunities for coordination between federal and regional expertise. At the national level, I'm sure you are aware, there's been a flurry of executive orders that speak to the administration's highest priorities, including ending the COVID pandemic, economic recovery, and conserving the environment. As we undergo a, tra a transition in our nation's government and at NOAA, it is clear to me more than ever before how well poised we are to lead the administration's emerging priorities to combat climate change at home and abroad. 
NOAA's leadership and reputation as a science agency has, and one with strong relationships and partnerships within the coastal and ocean management community position us very well to be a leading contributor to the administration's agenda on climate change, racial equity, and economic recovery. In my conversations with the new NOAA policy team and the White House, I make sure that any structure, sorry, any infrastructure, jobs, or economic recovery initiatives that they are discussing are considering those of ocean and coastal observations and our modeling enterprise across climate services. In fact, I see it as more important than ever as we combat climate change and start the long process of economic recovery. I see it as important because we know this um, and we are educating others, but our nation's economy and overall well being is disproportionately reliant on our coastal industries and infrastructure. For that reason, we have to remain laser focused on how we are preparing for coastal inundation and sea level rise. A wise man named Mark Osler, NOAA's Senior Advisor for Coastal Inundation and Resilience once told me, and I think he picked this up from Ann Phillips, we have to stop shooting behind the duck when it comes to preparing for coastal hazards. Now, if you're not a, a hunter, you might have to think about that a little bit, but if you shoot at the duck, right, the bullet goes behind the duck. Carl knows this, Carl Goldman. Um, but the only way we can shoot um, ahead of the duck and actually hit the mark is through modeling and predictive capabilities. They are so incredibly important to our preparations for climate change, whether it's industry, academia, or the federal government trying to predict the future. If we can't predict the changes ahead, we're just going to keep watching the waters rise around us. And I know that that's not what we're here to do. We're here to provide services, decision support, and data to solve, not just describe people's problems. And it's not just enough for us to have long-term data series. In an era of increasing change, the future may not be anything like what we've seen in the past. Not to say we shouldn't keep on taking that information but conditions are changing. So we have to be modeling and we have to be predicting the changes and those associated risks. So to implement this vision, we need to integrate individual sea level rise modeling efforts at the local and regional scale. So modeling and observing networks such as those within the IUS regional associations are a key part of this. As a core of what they do, IUS RAs directly address the needs of stakeholders and managers through active collaboration and partnerships. And within NOAA, we are following suit as collaboration is becoming more and more the name of the game. NOAA is working across all line offices, for example, to improve our Earth system modeling framework. Many of you may already be familiar with or involved with some of these efforts, including work that NOS is doing alongside the National Weather Service on coastal modeling and recent improvements in the non-tropical coastal flood warning, storm surge modeling, and other projects coming out of the National Water Center are becoming increasingly essential components of our work together to operationalize a coastal coupling model. Weather Service Director and I, Louis Uccellini, are getting to have more and more fun as we talk about the importance of our collaborative efforts and how we cannot wait for them to really bear fruit. As a part of, as another example, as a part of the NOAA Water Initiative, we established a coastal coupling community practice and are working to expand that effort to enable more partners to participate. The goal of this effort is to accelerate national coverage of integrated water prediction capabilities through the adoption of community research and models. We look forward to working with the Weather Service and our other partners and stakeholders to better understand the variety and significance of networks of observing systems and how to use them for both improving the short-term and long-term forecasting and modeling. And we are learning um, as we have known, but increasingly are finding out that this kind of co-creation of observation and modeling approaches across uh, the federal government, across NOAA, and even across sectors is crucial for moving the needle forward on this work. If you are interested in hearing more about some of this, um, I would uh, suggest you get connected with Kayla Dean, who is leading this effort uh, within NOS. Um, and stay tuned for a presentation tomorrow from Mark Osler as he discusses NASA NOAA efforts 
um, on sea level rise called the RISE Project. So just some more examples of how NOAA relies on longstanding partnerships. And with you all, um, that is, that, that's absolutely part of the game with academia, with stakeholders, with tribals, uh, governments, as well as working across the federal government and all of you listening now as we pursue comprehensive and accurate earth system modeling. And in the light of climate change, advances in research and modeling must be incorporated into operational modeling and forecast system. And it's through efforts like this workshop, which actively and activate, uh, sorry, actively cultivate multi-sector community of researchers, stakeholders, and possibly private industry as important steps to reach national scale coordination. In order to make these advancements, however, and advancements on the West Coast in particular, we will continue to be talking to regional users like you. Our regional collaborations with entities like the IUSRAs will drive and will enable our research questions and co-development of solutions. NOAA is committed to developing solution-driven science and for supporting community processes that allow an efficient co-development of knowledge and practical solutions and applications for coastal resilience and adaptation. Thank you all for being such an integral part of this and thank you for the opportunity to come speak with you for just a few minutes today. The work you're doing this week is incredibly important and we are so proud to be working as your partner. Next, I'll turn it over to Carl Goldman. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Mark, Laura, and Ocean Visions and all of those involved in organizing this workshop for having me today. Um, as Nicole mentioned, sea level rise, coastal flooding, and coastal resilience are a priority for NOAA and NOS, and ultimately the Integrated Ocean Observing System Office, along with many other NOAA programs, and even my dog next door. Um, as Nicole said, collaboration is the game. We've all been working at multiple levels within NOAA and the interagency arena and the regional and local levels, as well as with many partners and experts in academia, private sector, and the NGO community. I'm glad to see experts from the community here convene for the next couple of days. I'm sorry I can't be there on the West Coast with you. I love coming out that way. Um, hopefully we'll be there soon. Uh, our goal at IUS is to establish and sustain a national integrated coastal ocean observing system in order to serve communities and protect lives and livelihoods. This includes the full value chain from observations to data management, to modeling and predictions, to product and service development and delivery. We cannot do this alone, and in our office and in the IUS regions, we work across other critical federal programs to integrate capabilities and add data and information into other program mission areas as needed to maximize benefits. This means we work with the Office of Coast Survey on mapping and charting and modeling, and we work with the Center for Oceanographic Operational Products and Services, excuse me, the Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services on water level information and modeling, and with the National Weather Service on multiple levels as well. This is just a sampling of all of the programs we intersect with. And for all of our partnerships, we strive to ensure, as Nicole said, to ensure that our efforts are targeted to meet stakeholder needs. I may be biased, but I truly believe that the IUS mission and the federal non-federal partnership that is established in law is an elegant framework. This framework allows us to further our ability to deliver coastal solutions and a flexible mechanism for advancing capabilities through the ecosystem of players in the research to operations and operations to research community. We call that R2O2R. Workshops like this allow us to share visions and find ways to collaborate, leverage our work and develop strategies uh, to reach shared goals. I especially like your objective to identify integration opportunities because that will help us use our framework to advance our collective ability to deliver coastal solutions. How can this work? Well, at the last Ocean Visions workshop on the East Coast this past summer, Sakura, our Southeast IEAST region, included new ideas into their next five-year proposal based on the workshop, which identified the need for lower costs, maybe different resolution in terms of accuracy sensors for water level data to fill in gaps from our national water level network to help with the local and regional modeling needs of the community. So that's just one example of how these workshops can help. Uh, within NOAA and the IUS network, we want to learn more about how we can help you as well and how we can create a dynamic suite of products throughout the entire West Coast so people on the coast can make better and more informed critical decisions. I hope that today and tomorrow, 
the discussions celebrate the latest developments, identify gaps in our understanding of the coast, and make better and more informed critical decisions. I think I repeated. Sorry about that. Uh, while we're here, I hope we can leverage this networking opportunity, strengthen our partnerships, and lay out the next steps to delivering better services to coastal communities. Our vision for the future includes robust community approach to modeling that allows R&D and operational modeling to have feedback loops and will help identify requirements for the next improvements needed in our ocean and coastal forecasting services. So internally, what are we doing about this within NOS and the National Ocean Service? Well, we've always worked to develop user products for managers and stakeholders that make decisions. However, our stakeholder needs are growing in ways that Nicole clearly articulated. To meet these increasing demands and to better understand coastal <sighs> threats, strategic collaboration, somebody's not on mute, Jan and not me, um, and communication more than ever within NOAA and with the extramural modeling community. One step we've recently made towards this future vision for ocean modeling was creating a new position uh, within the National Ocean Service that we call the, the NOS Coastal Modeling Portfolio Manager. And her name is Dr. Tracy Finera. And we established this position for two primary reasons. First, essentially we realized we needed to enhance collaboration across NOS programs and support planning, project selection, project management, and activities across the ocean prediction enterprise within the National Ocean Service and to coordinate that across NOAA and with our broader coastal community and coastal modeling community, i.e. you. Um, second, Dr. Fernera also oversees the implementation of our IUS Coastal Ocean Modeling Testbed Program. And the COMT is, um, the COMT program is designed to help transition models towards operations and then transition them into operations. And so we've got a whole series of projects in hand from a new funding opportunity announcement we just finished and we're in the merit review process for those proposals right now. Um, the coastal communities, coastal coupling community of practice that the Weather Service has created as part of the water initiative is a key thing for bringing folks together. We also are hosting a general ocean and coastal modeling community modeling workshop shop this summer um, that Tracy Fenera will be leading. And that's um, a slightly different lens. It's more the ocean and coastal community not just the national water model coupling community. So this is community like yours. So um, we plan to bring folks together and work on understanding priorities and obstacles and, and to deliver nationwide ocean prediction for coastal decisions, similar to your scale today, but sort of national scale. Uh, so stay tuned for more on the scheduling and uh, invites for that. And then finally, a couple of updates. Let me close with the acknowledgement of two community built successes. We have two new operational forecast systems for the coast, the West Coast Operational Forecast System and the Northern Gulf of Mexico Operational Forecast System. And these are just on the cusp of be becoming operational. So much so that I saw announcements that they were operational. And then we've had some real system-wide issues unrelated to the models um, that have prevented connectivity and data flows. So those are pause briefly, and as soon as the systemic issues are fixed, those models will be operational, hopefully within days, if not within a week. So with that, again, with this workshop, it's encouraging to see that as, as we're building collaboration in this field and we bring experts together, we continue to identify where we can be working together better and evolving opportunities for coordination between federal and regional expertise. This collaboration is key to success of this work and it can, I continue to stress that without us all working together and our partnerships, this work can't move and evolve at the pace that we need it. In conclusion, I look forward to the rest of the agenda today and further discussions tomorrow. Thank you for having me and for your work this week. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Nicole and Carl. Um, we wanted to get the perspectives of someone with a, a wall full of art and someone with one photo will do or one picture will do. So that's great. Um, any questions real quick before we move on to the next part of the agenda? I did wanna say that um, we realized that this is a national network and that we're only starting out with these three workshops looking at the continental coast and we are intending to include the island regions and Alaska in future workshops. So just to, just to let you know that this is a true national approach. I think we are ready to switch over then to Clarissa. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, Carl and Nicole. Those were both great talks. Um, 
And great segue now into our first panel where we're gonna focus on monitoring networks and solutions. And what I'd like to do is just step through very quickly um, my own thoughts as moderator as of, of some of the things you're gonna see, but then um, a few things that you might not know about IUSE assets and what we're thinking uh, could be useful for some of this work down the road. And these are our panelists. We'll get to hear their, their uh, use cases in just a bit. This doesn't want to advance. There we go. Uh, for those of you on the call who aren't fully familiar with um, the regional associations that you keep hearing about for, for IUSE, what I want to point out here is that on the West Coast, the three groups that have been involved in this discussion are NANUS, SENCUS, and SCUS, uh, and I sit at SCUS down at Scripps Oceanography. Um, and we have quite um, a, a wide portfolio, but um, I won't be able to go into all of that today. I will touch on just a few things, in particular, um, the coastal hazards component that we work on, obviously. Um, I can touch a little bit on marine operations and also a bit on some of the assets we have that really fall into the climate variability and change work that can um, get us towards an, a better understanding of things like sea level rise, as well as storm processes that are connected to climate change. Um, and these are some maps that just kind of very broadly illustrate what we have in our regions for SCUS, SENCUS, and then NANUS in the Pacific Northwest. So we'll be hearing from, from Jim Behrens today, who is the CDIP program manager. And so we'll get into this in detail, but I wanted to just highlight that, um, there is a national wave buoy network, the CETA network. We don't mean to just isolate California here, but because it's SCUS, we work very closely with uh, the CETA group. It's important to note that this wave buoy network has been really essential at driving um, models for some of the nearshore work. So taking these model output points is really helpful for initializing other nearshore models that you're going to hear about, in particular understanding of flooding, inundation, wave runup. Um, and that some of this stuff also feeds into the marine operations sector because these data can be incorporated in real time, automated alerts for ship captains. We have an important project called the Underkeel Clearance Project working with the Port of LA and Port of Long Beach and the Marine Exchange of Southern California to bring these massive tankers and cargo ships into port. And it, and it is essential and it really does rely on these data. Um, so thinking about these existing systems that we have in place, both the, the CDIP buoy system, NOAA tie gauges, homing in on Southern California here on the map, um, we've been thinking about how to forecast water levels for particular beaches. And SCUS has been really helping support this, the, not only the extant models that we have, but expansion of this network into Southern California to capture most of the beaches that we can. Um, and I'll get into what some of that means and have you think about the additional information that we might need to do this accurately since um, folks like Mark Merrifield, Julia Fiedler and others are really working on this in great detail. And so this is a nice snapshot of the kinds of um, sensors and other monitoring techniques that are going to help improve the um, fine scale accuracy of wave runup. You're seeing a schematic on the left um, and then a more real world picture on the right, you're gonna hear more about the Imperial Beach Warning System in just a bit. Um, but you can see it's things like very pressured sensors, um, LIDAR is becoming more and more crucial to this effort. And these photographs illustrate all the ways and fun ways really that one can get out there and do this kind of stuff. <clears throat> and then at SCUS, um, we work really closely with the Climate Change Impact and Adaptation Group and CDIP to try to expand the distribution of these forecasts at the various beaches. Um, we include not only the forecasts, but historical flood records and um, think about how this performance can be measured by the number of sites where the flood models have been calibrated and validated using all the techniques you saw on the last slide. Um, there's also a set now that continue to grow of crowdsourcing apps for flood <clears throat> type photos. And now, so moving from some of the maybe more well-known things, I wanted to think about how we're really growing the IUS network. Um, we've, we've put a lot of investment in things like high-frequency radar, gliders, um, automated shore stations. 
and buoys, as well as ecosystem moorings. And all of these things may have some interesting abilities that we're not fully working on yet, even though in our next five-year proposals, we, we definitely push the boundaries of what we could we could do with what we have right now in the water. We'd like to think about other things. And one of those that came to my attention recently was this meteo tsunami kind of detection using CODAR. And this was done to look at a, a, a storm that was it in like, you know, a while ago now, but 2013 on the Eastern seaboard. And uh, this Q factor, it's a dimensionless value. Um, they take the radar data and then look at two kilometer rectangular strips parallel to the coast and then look and then analyze these basically the spikes in velocity within those bands. And so you're seeing that plotted here with respect to time and respect to the band number. So this is just one example of the kinds of experimental products that are out there. Uh, Weira systems, which we aren't using so much in the West Coast RAs, some of the East Coast ones do, but Oceans Network Canada uses Weira high frequency radar. And this was a pretty use of those data to, to look at tsunami detection. This was a 2016 typhoon song that hit, that hit the West Coast of Canada. And, um, and so you're just seeing an example, another example of how radar can be used for some of these interesting storm run up and even sea level rise um, monitoring and forecast products. We all on the West Coast invest a lot in gliders. Um, this is a, a long running program and in California, the California Underwater Glider Network run by Dan Rudnick and others is really an important example of these glider programs. And um, we've been using it to look at climate variability, some of the low frequency changes and connections to the equatorial Pacific. But what Dan Rudnick pointed out the other day to me anyway, that I hadn't really appreciated was that we can evaluate the local regional effects of warming as the steric height anomaly for a region. And what you're seeing in this Huffmuller diagram for line 90, which is in Southern California, is that the, these warming events, these large marine heat waves that we've come so familiar with now, like the one that began in 2014, had a noticeable effect, along with the El Nino of 2016, had a noticeable effect on the steric height anomaly for our region. So these are just little things I'll, I'll leave, um, little amuse-bouche, I guess, for the rest of the panel, we're gonna look at the use case studies now and uh, watch those videos together. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great. Thanks, Clarissa. Um, it was really great to hear, and especially as we're experiencing more marine heat waves, some ways that we might wanna monitor those marine heat waves in relationship to our sea level rise variability. Oops. All right, so I'm jumping ahead. Um, uh, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and start showing videos uh, and I encourage folks to go ahead and put their questions in the chat box. And um, then we will have the leads for these videos uh, prepared to answer some questions just following that. So let's see if I can. I'm not hearing any sounds. Anybody else? Uh, no, I think I'm going to. I'm sure you need Laura, sorry. All right, give me one second. It might just be a, a split screen issue. Let me try and move it back. Two. Oh, all right. 
sorry. Give me a second, can't seem to figure out how to move it back to my other screen. Oh, I could potentially it. try playing it from here and screen sharing if you like. Um, well, I have it. It just doesn't, oh, I couldn't get it back to the main screen, which I think is the problem because the audio is only on one. On one. One more time. Laura, otherwise, I also have a copy ready to go if you want. Okay. How's that? Still no sound. Moni, you want to give it a try? If you enable my share, uh, sharing the screen, I can try to play it. Sure. I think um, Anne also has them on her. OK, thing. or Anne, that's fine. Yeah. Uh. Go ahead, Anne, and see if that works. Still no sound. And try to unmute yourself as well. And so we first used to study California waves by Walter Monk. Let me start that again. Sorry. The Coastal Data Information Program at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography maintains an operational model of nearshore wave conditions along the entire ocean coast of California. Offshore, deep water directional wave buoys, um, primarily these data well wave riders, are used to initialize a linear spectral refraction wave model. And I'll mention that spectral refraction was first used to study California waves by Walter Monk and collaborators back in the 1960s. These uh, wave riders are um, deployed in an array around the country. This is what the Cedar Beret looks like at the moment. There are about 70 stations active and um, about 25 of those are here in California. We have the California coast pretty well covered um, with the few exceptions in Northern California and up there we rely on some of the National Data Buoy Center um, met buoys to provide uh, wave data to um, fill in those gaps. So coming back here to the CDIP website, if you pick a particular station such as San Nicolas Island out here, um, we've got all kinds of data products including the polar spectrum. Now the 2D spectra at each buoy station location is computed um, by applying the maximum entropy method directional estimator to the low order directional coefficients. And so this provides an estimate of where the wave energy is coming from, both in direction and in period, longer periods closer to the center, shorter periods out here um, towards the edge. Now, given all of this uh, wave information, the California wave model is generated um, every hour. So now this uh, by default on the CDIP website shows what we call the nowcast. This is taking the most recent wave data from the buoys and um, computing what the conditions are going to be like along the coast over the next few hours. And so this uh, is the animation of the significant wave height. If we choose one time step, it'll freeze it and show the directional uh, arrows. This is the direction um, of the waves at the peak period of the energy spectrum. And uh, there's a little bit more going on here than we initially indicate. You can crank up the resolution and see 
um, all the detail in the gradients of the uh, wave height. And uh, you can also zoom in on particular sections of the coast. Um, in addition to this now cast driven by the buoy uh, data itself, we also provide a forecast which takes wave watch three forecasts from NOAA's um, operational sort of national weather service um, wave forecast and um, takes those values at the buoy locations and propagates that through the uh, model to um, provide a forecast along the coast. And so this goes out several days. The model forecasts, uh, hindcasts, nowcasts of the spectral parameters commonly used in nearshore process studies and engineering design are provided to the public, including validations against the nearshore buoy observations here on our CDIP MOPS website. This is CDIP slash MOPS model output points. Now the details of um, all this modeling are here in this coastal engineering article, uh, Bill O'Reilly, was the lead author on this work, uh, dates back to the 90s. Um, and Corey Olfi has been working with CDIP for nearly that long and uh, now is in charge of maintaining the operational model. Uh, Julie Thomas was the program manager for many years. And uh, going back over here to the MOPS website, um, the documentation over here will um, tell you everything that you want to know. Uh, and if you go county by county, you can select transect map and this shows you just how dense the um, predefined output transects are. Um, these go from 10 meter isobath to the shore and um, the shore normal orientation is computed. I'm zooming in on the Scripps pier area. Uh, we'll use this as our reference um, example. And um, over here on the left, you can see all the different data products that are available for that location. You can see uh, the wave forecast, for instance, shows um, what the wave uh, bulk parameters look like there. If you use the Wave Watch 3 forecast or if you use the actual buoy observations. And um, in addition to the standard wave bulk parameters, we also have um, plots showing what the radiation stress is doing at the coastline, as well as um, a rudimentary um, computation of the total water level using the Stockton formula. Um, now there's uh, historic coverage to provide now casts, or I'm sorry, um, hindcast back to the year 2000 in Southern California and nearly that far in uh, Northern California. For a given month, you can bring up the data display as well as over here, the output metadata shows what was actually input. Um, from uh, buoys. There are swell buoys within 400 kilometers. Um, seas buoys are within 75 kilometers. And um, all of this yeah, is uh, available to the public. And I'll just end things um, by showing um, the complexity that this model illustrates in uh, the Southern California bite. This is a monochromatic swell being pushed through the model just to kind of demonstrate all the shoaling, uh, which is in orange and the shadowing that occurs for different swell angles. Thank you. And then let me try one more time to share the video, the other next video up. Jim, hang on, we're going to show the two other videos and then we'll open it up to questions. Imperial Beach experiences overtopping and flooding when energetic winter swell coincides with high tides. The video that you're looking at here is from an event in January 2019, which was a high tide, 
that coincided with a large swell event. The frequency, duration, and severity of these events will increase with sea level rise, and the ability to predict them depends on the degree to which wave-driven runup can be specified. An observing system and modeling effort have been developed to determine how uncertainties propagate through the estimate of total water level, or TWL. And there's many different moving parts to this puzzle. On the development side, we have long running observations to make our model. We have 20 years of hindcast waves from the MOPS wave system, courtesy of CDIP, and 10 years of surf zone bathymetry data collected with our group from beach surveys with jet skis, ATVs, and push dollies. This information is fed into a phase resolving model SWASH. But because phase resolving models can be computationally expensive, we develop an emulator based off the extremes that is eroded beaches and large offshore waves. This is the IPA or the integrated power law approximation, which takes into account the shape of the wave energy spectrum rather than the bulk parameters, which we have found um, to perform better than a tuned Stockton 2006 type of equation at this particular beach. The modeling study that created the IPA was validated with observations from the event shown on the first slide. Operationally, we use a beach slope model and MOP now casts, which ultimately derive from WaveWatch 3. And the tide and non-tidal residual are from NOAA or the La Jolla pier gauge, um, which we found to not be that different from Imperial Beach itself. And those factor into the beach slope model and the total water levels in the final forecast. Each of these components does have uncertainty. And trying to understand how they all play together is part of the puzzle. What are the limiting factors to having skillful predictions? And what spatial resolution do you need to understand um, how flooding can be predicted along the Imperial Beach shoreline? In addition to the short-term flood forecasts, the information is being used to improve climate projections that quantify sea level rise impacts and provide a framework to assess adaptation strategies such as sand replenishment and berm construction and give the inhabitants of Imperial Beach a better understanding of the combination of factors that lead to flooding and how these factors are likely to change in the future. Noting here that there was a recent nourishment in 2012 a bunch of sand was piled on this beach, but a lot of it did head south towards the Tijuana River mouth, which has potential implications for the health of the estuary system. Our goal with the Imperial Beach project is to collect all the information you could possibly need to address the coastal flooding issue, and then determine what subset of this information is needed to establish similar systems in other locations along the coast at substantially reduced cost and effort. And the shoreline prediction system is going to, and has been extending this strategy to state parks and beaches in California. So California coastal parks and beaches face the same challenges as Imperial Beach. Sea level rise will increase coastal flooding, groundwater inundation, beach and cliff loss, and shoreline retreat. And effective mitigation and planning requires monitoring and understanding coastal change as it unfolds. The California Coastal Park units need baselines to contextualize future change. And in the short term, timely high water level warnings, similar to those at Imperial Beach, are needed to prepare the facilities and the at-risk natural and cultural resources. In the longer term, we're working to develop the state-of-the-art observing systems and predictive tools needed to understand the coming risks and to develop cost-effective, proactive adaptation strategies. All right, great. So one more. Hi everybody, my name is Ian Miller and I'm the Coastal Hazard Specialist at the Washington Sea Grant Program based uh, in Washington State and I'll be describing the development of a volunteer-driven and opportunistic study of coastal flood uh, components that leverages Washington's King Tides program. Uh, Bridget Trosen from Washington Sea Grant manages our King Tides program in Washington State, 
and David Wilkinson, Barney Burke, Jeff Taylor, and Cindy Jane are with Local 2020, which is a citizen climate advocacy organization based in Port Townsend, Washington. So first off, the King Tides program was developed in 2011 in Washington State and was designed to facilitate the collection and archiving of photos of the shoreline during extreme water level events, colloquially known as King Tides. The primary motivation was and continues to be using the program as a way to help people visualize a future in which events that we now view as extreme are more commonplace and to there, thereby facilitate sea level rise planning and resilience. The core operation of the program, therefore, is associated with encouraging people to take and submit photos like the two examples that you see on the screen here. Um, the program is currently uh, run using uh, an app called MyCoast and the database of photos is available online. The link at the bottom of the screen will take you there. So in 2016, there was a convergence between first a data gap in Puget Sound associated with the degree to which waves breaking on the shoreline contribute to coastal flooding and a group of motivated volunteers and advocates based in Port, uh, Port Towns in Washington, so the local 2020 group, who were interested in working to make the collection of King Tide photos more useful. We decided to use the opportunity to stand up a special monitoring team to collect photos and ancillary data to contribute to our understanding of the magnitude of wave runup in Puget Sound. As a result, I started working with the group to identify a site where we could do a couple of things. First, we wanted to collect repeat photos during extreme events at the same location. We wanted to use fixed features in those photos uh, to provide reference points against which the elevation of total water level during these events could be estimated. And three, couple those observations with ancillary data on still water level and wind at an adjacent tide gauge. The site shown in these photos adjacent to the Northwest Maritime Center in Port Townsend was selected. In 2017, the group started to monitor extreme events at the site and started to collect total water level uh, in, started to make their own total water level estimates in 2018. For each event, the group compiles an event report, integrating their own observations with concurrent water level and weather data collected at the tide gauge or from other sources like the weather and uh, weather data that you see on the screen here. To date, the team has monitored 18 events at the site 11 of which included their own total water level estimates. So the collection of concurrent observations of still water level from the adjacent tide gauge allows us to estimate a run-up magnitude when coupled with the team's total water level estimates. Um, and observations of run-up magnitudes associated with a waves are virtually absent on the shores of Puget Sound. So, uh, you know, these observations are unique. Our plan is to start to relate those to longer wind time series to build things like wave run up frequency estimates and a proxy total water level time series that can be integrated into flood exposure maps or compared to model outputs like FEMA's coastal flood study results or USGS Cosmos results. So um, at the bottom of the screen, note uh, a very initial attempt to relate concurrent wind speed recorded at the tide gauge with the team's estimate of wave runup, the wave runup uh, component of total water level um, uh, after uh, about 10 events. So even though uh, this program is opportunistic, small scale, and um, in its early stages in terms of providing uh, data associated with enough events to really start to develop meaningful relationships. Um, critically, and by way of conclusion, what we've demonstrated through this project is that we can leverage a program like King Tides um, and the citizen engagement associated with it to fill existing observational data gaps about coastal flooding components in places like Puget Sound, where those sorts of data are otherwise um, very, very difficult to uh, collect.
Well, those were all really great. Um, Laura, so we're gonna open the floor now to questions from the audience. I noticed it popping up in the chat that we could gladly take, um, for instance, Alex, if you wanted yes. to ask a question. And I can say I, I'll jump in with that. Um, so Alex asked, uh, is there a data product that merges both CDIP and local beach LIDAR data? If so, where is that available? So uh, Bonnie Lutka is on as a participant. Bonnie, are you there? Hi all, yeah. Uh, we, we've published uh, 16 years of, of the data set, the local beach data set, and I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, hang on a second. And hang on one second. Um, okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? This is a question about Imperial Beach. Um, Let's see, you mentioned that in addition to short-term forecasts, uh, the information is uh, being used to improve climate projections that quantify sea level rise impacts. Are you aware of whether Imperial Beach has incorporated it into its adaptation plan? And if so, in what way? Not yet. Uh, okay. we're, we are in address addressing that question as well as I see there's a further one about from Rick Wilson on whether how we're working with the city um, emergency managers and public works departments, we um, there we built the system hand in hand with their input. Um, that they were our clients essentially. They requested that particular format. Uh, we're working now to expand that into um, mapping tools and other types of info that uh, can be used more directly into some of their projects. How they're using the data right now is mainly for alerts. So you'll see signage and um, crews will be alerted and on, will be on, whole, uh, on call when there's a expected flooding event. Um, and to be honest, that's been a little touch and go. We've, uh, when you're trying to predict a yes or no flood, it can be really dicey and you don't wanna over <laughs> yell wolf, uh, cry wolf too many times. And so we've been slowly going back and forth with the city trying to come up with a reliable system of alerting. And uh, that's still, I would say, in progress. OK, thanks. Um, one quick other last uh, question related to that. Um, how has the State Parks Department used the strategy, if at all? You talked about the integration with them as well. Uh, Julia, do you want to take that one? Actually. Bob, are you on the line? Bob Guza? Yeah, Bob, Bob can take it. Yeah. So just to let you know, a lot of what we're doing uh, through scripts with Coastal Work grew out of Bob Guza's group. And so let's get Bob into the mix here. Uh, can you repeat the question? It was, how is Parks using the results? Correct, yes. Or how you know have they used this this strategy as well, not just the results, but you talked about the you know partnership with them. Well, they're very interested in the exposure of their facilities in the coming, in the future, and that includes both seasonal and longer term. The longer term can only be as accurate as the long-term climate forecasts. Right now, what we're giving parks is a seasonal prediction every winter of how serious we expect the erosion to be at various beaches in Southern California. And they can use that for planning purposes. So we're trying to give them forewarning and that's and the warning is based on a combination of various ocean indices like uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and things like that, and also includes the responses that we've measured at state parks to previous sorts of weather events. So we're trying to use the past information 
to inform seasonal winter forecasts. Now, how they use that, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Go I'm ahead and out of we're... time. Go ahead. Yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna do one more experimental. Uh, but feel free to go ahead and, and ask questions in the chat box. I'm gonna related to a lot of the topics that we heard about in terms of priorities for ocean observations going forward and how citizen science or um, crowdsourcing data could be used. I'm gonna actually have all the participants attempt to use a Slido poll to give us some, ex some of their direct inputs. So I'm gonna share that screen. Can you all see that? Yes. All right. So if everyone can go to that slido.com and punch in the number of 509741, you should be able to add your input to what top two priorities for observation expansion or enhancements would best contribute to community flood solutions that you know about. All right, I got one response so far. <laughs> okay, so we heard some about wave boundary conditions, additional bathymetry information, winds, more frequent coastal LIDAR beach profile surveys, more water level observations and estuaries, a lot more on beach morphology and um, beach dynamics. Awesome. See a lot of beach morphology information, <laughs> a lot of wave and winds, additional observations. Um, additionally, more photos of extreme events long-term estuary water level changes and variability. Awesome. We'll give one more minute. And then I have one more question for you guys. All right, so we're going to switch it up. You should still be able to see a new question. So this relates to the video that Ian shared um, and some of the conversations about community source or crowdsourcing, citizen science observations, whether folks are, are evolving to think about using these, currently using these, would like to or only use them for validation or don't at this time find them useful. Well, it's really interesting that people are not using them, mostly are not using them currently, but would like to. So thanks Ian for giving us an idea for how uh, some uh, King Tides data might actually be used at a more like site specific repeated water level validation. Okay, awesome. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for that. I'm going to stop sharing. We'll try using that program one more time a little bit later in the day. But uh, as of right now, we're going to switch it up and uh, change to Peter Ruggiero, who's going to kick us off for our next panel. Thanks, Clarissa. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Mark, Julia, Bob Guza, all those who contributed to those first case studies and uh, got the conversation started. Thanks, Laura. You'll share that slide I sent you? Yeah. Great. 
All right, well, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the second panel of the Coastal Flood Modeling Prediction and Observations for the U.S. West Coast Workshop. Um, so in a recent study by Tahar Khani, Vitusik, Barnard, and others, it was suggested that in some U.S. locations, the present day 50 year extreme still water level, which is the 2% annual chance of exceedance still water level based on historical records, that event might be exceeded annually before 2050. And findings of the study also suggested that this might be true for about 70% of coastal regions in the United States. So obviously the problems that many coastal communities are facing now regarding coastal flooding are already a significant issue. And Laura, that slide? Uh that working? Yeah. Okay. Can you uh, click on the videos? Yeah. Please. How's that? Awesome. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, this slide is uh, showing multiple video loops of recent flooding events along the US uh, West Coast. So I think the Southern California that was already alluded to in this meeting um, from last summer, the impacts of the confluence of high tides and a sunny day with a, a, a swell event. Um, uh, the middle panel, um, Laura, are those videos rolling? Oh, I think if I click off of it, it stops. Okay, there we go. Great. Thank you. The, uh, that middle uh, uh, video is uh, Raymond, Washington, so it's a small community that's deep within Willapa Bay along the Washington coast, and it's experiencing nuisance tidal flooding more and more frequently. Along the Oregon coast, this is an example of uh, high wave runup uh, coupled with only modest storm surge, potentially coinciding with high tides and perhaps a, a, a modest tidal anomaly that can obviously cause uh, fairly dangerous conditions for both backshore properties and, and people as well. And so I think as, as we all know, uh, beaches, homes, roads, entire downtowns, wastewater treatment plants, many other types of, uh, of infrastructure along the coast are particularly vulnerable to coastal flooding now. And these, these issues are only going to get worse with sea level rise and associated with climate change. Um, and so with the aim of protecting infrastructure and saving lives. So Laura, we're seeing the, uh, the slido.com <laughs> shot again. I'm doing my best here. I don't know what's happening with the double slides. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, no worries. With the aim of uh, protecting infrastructure, saving lives, this uh, session that we're about to uh, embark on is going to highlight three studies uh, developing exciting contemporary flood exposure and operating uh, operational flood forecasting solutions. So basically uh, approaches to actually forecast these events that you're seeing in these video loops. So you're going to hear a couple of, uh, of brief uh, five minute videos from the US Geological Survey and you're going to hear one from the California Geological Survey in uh, three great exemplars of short-term forecasting solutions. So enjoy the, uh, the upcoming videos and uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Thanks very much, Laura. Thanks, Peter. I am here to report on an active efforts to forecast total water levels, including wave runup along all of the U.S. West Coast. This is a collaboration between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Weather Service, and SEP offices, and USGS. There are a bunch of people involved in this effort, and uh, some of them are listed in the bottom. And saving time, I'm just going to refer you to that. This in, uh, effort started on the East Coast back in 2015 or so and is currently undergoing national expansion. It provides 144 hours of forecasted total water levels and probabilities for collision overwash or impact, or so as we call PCOI. It is based on forecasts that are developed by, by NOAA. Waves and water levels are brought to the near shore and they are combined with the, uh, with the Sandy Coast wave runup formula of Stockton, very uh, well known such formula, and combined with beach profiles and foreshore slopes to provide 
uh, estimated total water levels, 2% exceedance. The products are presented to the public via two different viewers. On the top hand side, you can see the NOAA NWS viewers. And on the bottom, you can see the USGS viewer. The USGS viewer has two parts to it. And on the left hand side, you can see a screen grab from color coded dots that show the probability of P. coli. And on the right hand side is a graphic showing the forecasted total water level, uh, both in, in an animation style not shown here, but in the, pre, in the very first slide there was an animation. The solid water line, the solid line, sorry, is the total water level, whereas the um, cyan color is the 95% confidence interval. For the U.S. Uh, West Coast implementation, we made some changes just for the run-up formula and, of course, also for the beach profile and foreshore slopes. For the runoff formula, we added two different formulas to account for bluffs and cliffs. So the first one being for cliffs, simply being the short SPM Shore Protection Manual 1984, 1.5 times the first moment of the wave height in the near shore. The second formulation is for steep shores, and this is the so-called TAU formulation. It's an adaptation of this and it follows the FEMA guidelines and the uh, further information can be found in these references that you can see here listed at the top. It is a formulation that is also based on HMO in the near shore and it has a couple reduction factors, one being the influence of the berm and another influence for slope roughness. This is valid for the uh, slopes that are beyond the angle of repose, so of sand, so 36 degrees to 45 degrees is where we apply this. How is it decided which formula is used where? Well, in the simplest sense, it's a combination of NOAA's environmental sensitivity indices, which tell us what kind of backshore exists at each location, and also based on most commonly used formulas determined from a 60-year hind cast from 1948 to 2008. This hind cast will soon be available publicly as well via a manuscript and also a USGS data release. This uh, Shope et al. study, which was conducted by Shope and others, uh, consists of a total of 25,000 cross-shore elevation profiles extracted at one meter resolution from the USGS NOAA 2016 post El Nino LIDAR. We used that um, data set to develop 100 meter longshore average coherent database of foreshore slopes. Those were used uh, in combination with the run-up formula to, uh, to compute the total water levels. Formula selection is based on the water levels as well as the profiles. Current status of this effort is that uh, the total water level viewer is being implemented for all seven NOAA NSEP national weather or wave forecast sorry, weather forecast offices along the West Coast. New higher resolution swan wave models are being developed and implemented operationally, and the San Diego region is currently up and running. The total water level viewer is not quite ready for that yet, but it will be shortly within the next round. Updates for the remaining WFOs, including, including the total water level viewers for the remaining regions, are expected to be up and running within this calendar year. Following that, validations will be undertaken. We will be validating against any data that we can obtain, and most, but mostly webcams that are um, continuously collecting information. Furthermore, we are extending the study to Alaska, U.S. territories, and additional work is being conducted to include estuaries. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Bob Akter Wanirad and along with my colleague Liv Herdman, we're going to introduce Hydrocosmos Coastal Forecast System for the San Francisco Bay Area in this presentation. Uh, as Rob Sifali mentioned in the previous presentation, this model is part of the ATPR project. Um, this model is built with the Delta 3 flexible mesh model suit and uses a combination of 1D and 2D grid system to capture water levels within the San Francisco Bay Area. The 1D grid uh, cells are mainly used to capture 
the uh, river system in the San Francisco Bay Delta and also tidal channels and other small tributaries in San Francisco Bay to improve the efficiency and the physics of the model. This forecast uh, system is coupled on the offshore boundaries to a uh, global water level forecast system, HICOM, to import the remote non-tidal residuals. Um, it's also coupled on the discharge boundaries to national water model uh, uh, and uses the forecast data from national water model. And also on the, uh, for the surface, we're using the uh, atmospheric inputs from her forecast system and capturing the surface mean sea level pressure and wind velocity to simulate water levels within the San Francisco Bay. Um, the uh, one of the we, we have performed several case studies using this model. One of those case studies was focused on identifying the role of discharges and remote non-tidal residuals on capturing and forecasting water levels within the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was shown for uh, the swarm of February 2019 that remote non-tidal residuals, which are imported from HICOM and discharges, which are imported from the National Water Model, can contribute to about 10 to 25 centimeters of extreme water levels. So that showed that these models are a very significant part of a forecast system and we need to have them as part of our coastal forecast system. The operational system right now runs every hour and uh, produces 19 hours of forecast. And as you see in this picture, the model results are with an acceptable level of 10 centimeter error margin and it's running very smoothly. And we hope that we have this model out by the end of 2021. The initial goal of uh, this model is to provide users with time of first flood, flood duration, the time of peak flood, and also flood potential from wave runup. Uh, and as you see, products like uh, water level uh, for the entire San Francisco Bay and the inundation zone, um, and showing the inf infrastructure that could be uh, inundated uh, and flooded. Uh, however, uh, we're using this model in several other applications, which my colleague will dive into in the next slides. One particular application of this model will be to help with managing releases of the Crystal Springs Reservoir into San Mateo Creek. Um, the managers would like to know the water levels at or near this highway overpass, indicated here in the orange star, to manage reservoir releases in a way that minimizes flooding, as this is a critical um, part of transportation infrastructure in the area. On the lower left, we see the reservoir which drains into San Mateo Creek on its way to the bay. And this map shows the 1D representation of the channel um, in red, and again, this critical location is shown with the orange star. Um, usually there are no um, gauges below the discharge point. However, the reservoir managers had a short-term gauge at the highway crossing of concern for a few months in 2017, allowing us to perform this case study. Using the upstream observed releases, the model predicts water levels well at the place of concern. These hindcasts resulted in a mean error of 4 centimeters and a root mean square error of 14 centimeters. The largest error values that occurred um, are due to the times when the model discharged from the reservoir reached the observation point slower than it did in real life. This phase lag will be fixed in the next iteration of the model release, so we anticipate um, the errors only getting smaller. Of course, when running in forecast mode, we won't have the actual uh, upstream discharges, so we wanted to understand how forecast errors uh, will affect the simulations. This is represented by uh, phase lagging and lowering the actual observed discharge values. And we found that errors in the value of the peak discharge are much more important to water levels downstream than errors in phasing of the discharge. In low discharge time periods, such as um, what happens at the end of this simulation, uh, coastal water levels really dominate that location and the water level predictions are very good regardless of errors in the discharge. So this accurate prediction of coastal 
conditions will be very useful to managers attempting to uh, time upstream water level releases to low coastal water levels. And we also anticipate that our model results will only improve as regional improvements to the national water model occur. And we have one more. Hello, my name is Rick Wilson. I'm a senior engineering geologist with the California Geological Survey, and I'm the manager of the tsunami unit of the survey. I'm going to talk about our real-time tsunami evacuation and maritime response decision support tools we are developing for communities and for harbors. We have a number of partners that work with us, uh, including the National Weather Service, the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, as well as the University of Southern California. The 2011 Tohoku Oki tsunami caused $100 million worth of damage to 27 ports and harbors in California. We did not see inundation to a great extent inside the state. However, for harbors, they had very little information and had no understanding of where they expected to see damaging currents inside the harbors. This caught them off guard. This led to inconsistencies in response and where to reposition ships. For communities, because we knew that the tsunami was going to be relatively small in California and may not cause inundation, and the tidal conditions were going to be low, this led to some very inconsistent responses also for communities. Uh, they had the option of either doing an all out or nothing evacuation, and in many cases, there were these inconsistencies where they didn't know what to do. This has led the state to develop what we call playbooks, which are decision support tools that are scientifically based options for evacuation and response. Uh, for land-based evacuation, we rely on the total water level or faster approach, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then for maritime communities, we rely on understanding what the strong currents are and what kind of damage those currents will create. The evacuation playbooks depend on our capability to calculate what the total water flood elevation is. We do this for, through a very simple approach called the faster approach, which incorporates all the different variables that influence flooding, including the forecast amplitude from the tsunami, the forecasted storm and tidal conditions during the tsunami, the error in the modeling for the tsunami amplitudes, and the site run-up potential we have at each location. This leads to a realistic maximum tsunami run-up height and then to a playbook elevation line we can recommend to communities. The playbook plans are very straightforward. We provide plans ahead of time to communities, but in real time what we do is we do the faster calculation and then this tells us which is the best recommended plan to use or which phase to use for evacuation. So we provide this information in real time before the tsunami arrives to communities. They can then reference their playbook plan and then determine which is the best plan to use uh, for their response. For harbors, the main thing is the currents. The currents are what cause the damage inside these harbors. So when we have strong and unpredictable currents and eddies being formed, we want to be able to know where those are going to be located. And then where you may also get sudden water level fluctuations, as well as other factors, which may influence damage inside the harbors. Similar to the evacuation playbooks, we provide this information in real time also to harbors. We make a recommendation based on the forecast amplitude that is for that location uh, and associate a particular plan with it. These are all pre-planned. These are all in their documents for the harbors. They can then reference that particular plan and see where they're going to have damaging currents. The damage relationship between currents is basically at three, six, and nine knots, going from minor, moderate, to major or complete damage uh, inside the harbors. We have a lot of different uh, benefits of this approach. 
It tailors the tsunami response activities to particular communities and harbors uh, and provides some consistency and standards, uh, standardizes the approach statewide, uh, gives them a minimum response recommendation. They still could go with their uh, full evacuation or response if they like, and it could save money by not having to shut down businesses unneededly. Please visit tsunami.ca.gov for more information about our projects and program. Fabulous. So I'll turn it over to you, Peter. And just quickly mention for the AQPI video, I think Rob Sibeli mentioned it in the chat, but that was part two of two videos. So an overview video on the AQPI project is also available online as part of our case study videos. If you guys haven't checked it out already, you can do so over lunch. Yeah, thanks, Laura, and thanks to the folks that uh, developed those great videos. Um, so again, reminder, please put uh, questions in the chat, and I think Anne will be monitoring that um, as well for this session. But I've got a, I, I see a couple of the speakers um, in the audience, and I have a question for uh, Rick. Um, I, I was curious, how did you determine those um, the, those damage thresholds of the three, six, and nine knots? And uh, it sounds like a, a lot of uh, numerical modeling had to have been done to be able to forecast what the, uh, the currents would be during the uh, tsunamis. And so if you could speak a little bit to those details, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah, shortly after the um, Tohoku event, uh, we had uh, a lot of data to look at for California, as well as some of the data coming in from Japan. So we were able to uh, find where the damage was located within a number of harbors. We used five different harbors, Crescent City, Santa Cruz, Ventura, and uh, um, I believe uh, a port of LA, as well as down in uh, San Diego, one of the smaller port, smaller harbors, looking at that relationship between how the current velocity was uh, from the model data to, and the observed information that was coming out of the field. So. Um, we were able to basically categorize what the damage potential would be at each current level. And then, uh, you know, in a lot of the ways, this information isn't very useful. The current in information isn't directly useful for harbors. So we try to bend those current velocities in something they can understand and manage during an event. So uh, we've, we've come up with a scale of, of, you know, five or six different damage categories and related that to the current velocity. Um, so, uh, had, had a lot of data to work with, and uh, we've, we've been looking at other people that have done similar things in Japan and down in New Zealand, and they found similar types of results in the, the three to six to nine knot range, kind of categorizing that damage potential. Thanks very much, Rick. And are you seeing any uh, questions? Yeah, well, I've got a, um, let's see. First, this is a question uh, for Lee. Um, this is not in the chat. Um, you mentioned that the uh, total total water level and CC forecasts are expected to be available online uh, to the public later this year. Do you have an estimate of when? I'm a little hesitant to give an exact date, but I believe the next round, uh, we should be having most of it up and running and the next round of release I believe is in three months from now, next quarter. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, this, some of you may have seen this in the chat, but just to flag it, um, we had a question um, from Neil Weston, uh, Noah to Rob, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Neil wanted to know, have you compared your model outputs with those uh, from NOAA's San Francisco operational forecast system? And Rob, do you want to explain that more? I mean, you mentioned we've you shared the results and compared notes uh, with the NOAA NOS folks that are uh, the developers um, of, of that system. Yeah, no, I, I think the there's not a lot to add there, Neil. It's a good question. We're trying to coordinate mm -hmm. with Ocean Service uh, as best we can, um, because in the end, we just we want to make the operational forecast system. Um, as best as can be. Right now, it does not include um, uh, dynamic discharge from uh, the 
riverine inputs. Uh, so that's one advantage that we have and we're testing that. And so we're just at sort of the lessons learned and sharing ideas stage. And hopefully in the future, they'll be able to incorporate that into the uh, San Francisco operational forecast system. Great, thanks. Um, and this is a question for Rick. Um, are, this, are the tsunami current speed outputs of the models available for the public? There are some uh, peer-reviewed papers we have out there. I, I don't know if all the data is available uh, public-wise, but uh, we can. I can try to run down some of those uh, references and put them in the chat box there. Great, thanks. Um, uh, question for Lee. Can you please expand on the components of uncertainty that are included in the TWL forecast? The uncertainty is actually bounded around the foreshore slope. So it's the 95th percent uh, confidence in the role of the foreshore slope that we have at all the points within that region. Great, thanks. And I've got a quick question on integration. Uh, can you speak to um, whether this is being integrated into IUS or here in Southern California to SCUS? I don't believe it is. Okay. Thanks. That would be a great next step. Good idea. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. So anyone else out there have anything? Okay, Peter. Yeah, I actually had one last question for either uh, Liv or for uh, Bobak. Um, are, are waves included in the, uh, the model that you're working with right now for those for hydro cosmos? Um, they Yes, they will be. Yes. Okay. I mean, yeah. So we have we have a coupled swan with the flow of them. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And we're using WaveWatch 3 boundary conditions. Okay, great. So we've got another um, minute. If anyone else has any further questions. Here we go from Jeremy. Are the total water level, sorry, total water level estimates going to include hindcasts? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. The hindcasts are a separate uh, approach and data set that hindcast, we have a hindcast coming out, the 61 year long hindcast, um, and it should be available with it also within the next three months or so. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Rick, do you have any more uh, comments on um, states, you know, use this, the response that states on the West Coast have had to your system, if you want to elaborate that anymore? Um, obviously, get, you know, it's a real world threat that we have. Yeah, it, it's, it's really about getting information to the communities as quick as possible. So that's that's part of it. And these are only to be used for distance source tsunamis. Mm -hmm. um, primarily for Oregon, Washington, and northern part of our state, the, the focus is on the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a, a large local threat, you know, similar to what Japan faced in 2011. So um, their focus is primarily on that local source. And although they haven't integrated in the playbook approach for evacuation planning, they have started to integrate a lot of the, the damage current relationship information into their maritime planning. So Oregon, uh, uh, the Dogami has started to do that. And I think Washington will follow suit also, as well as Alaska. I think they've started to use the same approach. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the, um, the great question answers and the great presentations. I'll hand it back over to Laura. Great, thank you guys. We're gonna take a short break for lunch and restart back at one o'clock. Um, for Rob Cifelli and Lee Hardman, I apologize. It doesn't look like the part one video of the AQPI is loaded up yet, but I have it on an open Google Drive. So I'll just add that link to the chat for anyone who wants to watch that over the lunch period. And um, if you have any other questions or comments uh, during the lunch session, please feel free to add them into the chat se session. And otherwise, we will see you at one o'clock. Give folks maybe one more minute to get back from their lunch and then we can have you kick us off, John.
next panel. And I see a couple of new names of people that weren't probably able to make the morning session, which is great to see some, some additional folks join us. Welcome. All right, well, for everybody coming back from lunch, I hope you were able to uh, get a little exercise, get some food, re-energize, maybe some more caffeine to get through the next session. Um, and we're gonna move into our third panel, which is all about um, future flooding and long-term projections and the evolution of uh, science in this realm, and there's been a lot of different tools and solutions developed. So Don Mara from uh, NOAA's Climate Services Center in the Pacific region has generously offered to do an overview for this panel. So kick it off to you, John. Great, thanks. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. I know I enjoyed my breakfast and a cup of coffee over at this end, so watch out. Um, I'm just going to offer a few opening remarks to kind of provide some context. Um, so don't worry too much about the details on this slide. It's intended to just kind of tee up a couple of uh, these kind of key concepts. So as we heard earlier, um, really what we're interested in is sort of the local event likelihood. Um, you know, how high is the water going to get? How often is it going to get a particular height? Or how long is it going to sit at that height? And then when? Um, and so we've tended to approach that problem with, for a long time with the assumption that what did happen is what could happen. Um, and using that as a way to get a representative distribution to sample from. And so what that's meant for a long time was looking at still water level to tide gauges, doing what we call direct approaches, basically extreme value analysis to get a return level and create something like a bathtub model. Um, it's well recognized that there's problems with that and you know, we're moving on. Certainly one of the issues there is that um, simply you don't have a lot, not every place has a long enough record to sample from. And then because of the geomorphic, um, excuse me, geographic setting, places like tropical cyclones, there's such rare events that it's really difficult to ever get a long enough record to sample from. And so there's other techniques that have been um, put into place if you like to sample spatially. So to look at groups of tide gauges to get a better um, um, record or to do what I'm calling temporal, temporal sampling, resampling things like Monte Carlo to get synthetic records to sample from. So that, those are different approaches to kind of solve some of that problem. But that isn't really the only um, issue. Um, we've got this thing called uh, non-stationarity. Basically, um, we're not just talking about, you know, what the current extremes look like or what they've looked like in the past, but we need to look at things like trends and trends in sea level rise. We could spend a whole workshop on looking at sea level rise issues, you know, things like um, ice sheet melting, vertical land motion, whether we use probabilistic versus risk-based scenarios. But the point is that we need to account for this, uh, these trends as well as the um, existing uh, um, distribution. And then there are climate related patterns that complicate things as well. We heard a little bit about ENSO and things like PDO signals that are, it's really hard to predict in the future what they're gonna be like. And even more so issues like how might they change? How might patterns of tropical cyclone, um, tropical cyclone tracks or um, extra tropical cyclones, how might those change with the change in climate? And so we're starting to get some of that, those issues by looking at, uh, looking at exploring uh, uh, GCMs to get a little, at least some sense of what that might be doing to the um, uh, potential distribution. Uh, the, the other problem here is that we're really not just talking, um, stay on the other side, if that's on the other slide, if that's okay. We're not just talking about still water level, we're really talking about total water level. And we've heard that, we've heard, we've heard about waves coming into the picture. So, uh, now we've got to do things like bring them from offshore to onshore or them up the beach. And so we have hydrodynamic models. We need to account for different um, geomorphic settings as sandy beaches or um, coral reefs or estuaries. 
Um, when we're talking about total water level, um, I think recently we're really even thinking more compound than simply waves on the top of uh, on the mean sea level. We're bringing things like rainfall and stream flow um, to create a more true sort of total water level, and that can be important at particular settings, particular estuaries. And so we're not looking at flow just over the top, but we're looking at um, from below. Um, the last piece in here that complicates it, and we've talked a little bit about it too, it came up earlier, is morphodynamics. In many cases, where when we're approaching this problem, we're looking at fixed morphologies. We're not moving any sediment around, and that's, that's also an issue. So we're going to see three great um, examples of how folks are approaching this problem. Before we do that, let me go to the next slide. And so what we've been talking about is really what uh, what's commonly referred to as exposure. That's the likelihood of um, a potential event that could exploit a weakness or cause an impact. We need to put that in a larger decision support context. That's just part of the part of the problem. Um, there's a sensitivity component. In other words, what's the likelihood of a potential weakness being? Excuse me. What's the um, uh, weaknesses that are available to be exploited. So that's uh, things like thresholds and tolerances that need to be accounted for. We combine those two, we think of that as vulnerability. And then when we begin to look at the potential to adapt, um, the ability to respond, we think of that as adaptive capacity. And so all three of those together constitute resilience. In the context of adaptive capacity, it's not just engineering and uh, design sorts of considerations, but you begin to get into the whole human dimension side of the problem. Even things like governance and, and the like, social structures can have an impact on that, on the resilience side. So um, I just, again, I just kind of wanted to place some of this discussion in context, and hopefully this will help um, as you guys hear the next few presentations. Thanks. Great, thank you, John. Let me pull up my videos here. One second. Hi everybody, I'm Peter Zero from Oregon State University. And today I'd like to tell you about a project in which we've developed a stochastic emulator of the individual drivers responsible for extreme coastal total water levels. And how we're combining that set of drivers with high fidelity numerical models of coastal processes to drive coastal flood impacts research. This title slide shows a partial list of the cast of characters involved in this work and the institutions that have been funded by CERN. Now while our Goal is to develop methodologies and techniques that are applicable anywhere within the Pacific Basin. Today, I'm going to talk to you specifically about a case study at Naval Base Coronado in the San Diego Bay area of Southern California. And so there's no real need for me to motivate the need for understanding extreme coastal total water levels to this crowd. But through our deep discussions with uh, folks at the Naval Base in terms of engineers, practitioners, managers, etc., we came to understand that there's a lot of infrastructure um, on the base side with uh, piers and, and docks, et cetera, that have relatively low freeboard, as well as in the ocean side, there's a, a human uh, maintained berm that protects the backshore uh, infrastructure from coastal flooding. The naval base also has a desire to maintain a relatively wide beach um, for a variety of naval exercises. So there's a lot of concern with present day coastal flooding, as well as what conditions might look like into the future. Okay, so the objective of our work was really to develop a probabilistic approach to efficiently evaluate coastal flooding in both today's climate and under a range of possible future climates. The approach with which we took was basically to de develop a hybrid statistical dynamical downscaling technique, which takes advantage of a broad range of machine learning and data science advances. Now I can spend a lot of time on the details of the methods, which can be explained or found in the papers in the lower left-hand corner of this uh, slide. But in general, our approach uh, combines three components, first of which was the development of this emulator, or TESLA, which is the time-varying emulator for short and long-term analysis of coastal flooding. 
And so this uh, approach, Tesla, really takes advantage of the fact that coastal conditions that drive extreme total water levels are the result of synoptic sail meteorological forcing, which is in turn a consequence of basin scale quasi steady atmospheric and oceanographic patterns. So therefore, we take a weather typing approach in which we are able to produce synthetic time series of the individual drivers of extreme total water levels that preserve both the marginal and joint distributions. And so we're able to use Tesla to generate an infinite combination of the individual drivers of coastal total water levels. Now we want to combine that uh, information with high fidelity numerical models of coastal processes. In this project, we have partnered with Patrick Bernard's group at the USGS and their Cosmos model for Southern California, which is a combination of Delft and Swan models as well as XBeach models. And we uh, think through a library of a finite number of dynamic simulations based upon Tesla output in terms of input conditions. And then we develop surrogate models that are machine learning based with which we can actually pass now an infinite combination of the individual drivers through this numerical model in a relatively efficient fashion and develop time series of coastal flooding anywhere within the uh, region of interest. Okay, so what can Tesla produce for us? Here's a record of, of synthetic uh, combinations of individual drivers over a 10 year time period at hourly time scale that can be combined into a total water level proxy shown in the bottom panel. We can do this for 100 years. We can even do this for 500 years. We can do this for any number of combination of events we would like. And one thing that now we have this approach, we could actually pick off the annual maximum total water level produced by this range of combination of individual drivers. Using that uh, set of annual maximum, we could also then combine that with a much larger time series of, of Tesla output to actually find a whole slew of different combinations that produce the 1% exceedance event or the 100 year return level total water level event. And this really drives home the fact that not all extreme total water levels are created equal. In fact, there's an infinite number of combinations of things like wave height, period, storm surge, monthly mean sea level anomaly, all interfering with astronomical tides to produce extreme coastal total water levels at this and many other uh, coastal locations. So once we have this approach, we can actually develop a variety of really interesting applications, combining with sea level rise and other climate change projections. We can pass that information through Tesla, through the numerical model, the surrogate models of, of the Cosmos model. And we can develop products such as the number of days in which we have water levels that exceed peer use thresholds. We can derive these kinds of curves uh, for a variety of sea level rise projections at a variety of different time periods. And we can assess uh, different aspects of the, uh, of the pier and the and naval base Coronado's infrastructure and determine whether or not it'll be mostly functional, partially functional, or even potentially not functional latter parts of the century. We have another uh, potential application on the ocean side uh, using the X beach uh, surrogate models. We can actually determine the number of daylight hours that are available for the kinds of beach training that the uh, Navy actually performs at this site right now. And we can actually identify thresholds and potentially even tipping points over which the beach width might actually become too narrow to perform these kinds of uh, training exercises. So I'll leave you now with a couple of final thoughts, but just to remind you that we have basically combined dimensional reduction via Tesla, the climate emulator, computational reduction via these machine learning derived uh, emulators of the uh, model Cosmos. And with this combination, we can actually derive a wide range of coastal flood risk applications. Finally, I'd like to say that uh, Tesla is available uh, via open source uh, uh, code on this GitHub page, and I'd really like to thank you very much for your time and attention. Take care. Wonderful. All right. Next up, Eric Grossman, AUSGS with Puget Sound. Hi, I'm Eric Grossman, here to describe to you development of the Puget Sound Coastal Storm Modeling System which is benefiting from a great team and federal, tribal, and local partners. The goal is to develop a standardized regional flood model to evaluate exposure to extreme storm and wave events with outputs at one meter along shore to inform assessments and priorities for coastal zone management, ecosystem recovery, and our fiduciary responsibilities to tribal communities. We are doing this by downscaling global climate models to resolve the influence of tides, storm surge, river discharges, and waves on coastal flooding and shoreline impacts, making use of 2.5 kilometer resolution weather reanalysis products, 
bias correction for winds over water, and the coupling of wave run-up models to a new computationally efficient 2D flood solver. Outputs are mapped and served on web tools to easily view physical and socioeconomic exposure. And this year we are coupling models of long-term bluff change and the influence of infiltration in groundwater, which is hugely important in the Pacific Northwest with projections of significantly increasing intense rainfall in the coming decades. The model domain extends from the Columbia River north to above Vancouver Island with an unstructured grid for flow and includes the 24 largest rivers, including the Fraser. The model has a mean error of about 10 centimeters for water levels observed in NOAA and US gauges and this allows us to resolve the influence of remote storm surge that propagates from the ocean into Puget Sound with a magnitude up to a half a meter or so. The model benefits from a new one, one meter DEM that we published last year and extensive work to get the salinity structure correct to capture the increase in mean water surface elevation that we observe into the deeper reaches of Puget Sound. The 2D flood solver Sphinx allows us to output flood extent, depth, duration, and overland flow velocities at one meter for current sea level and discrete increments projected uh, in the future. With this workflow, we can also post-process results to define extreme event recurrence statistics cell by cell, like the two or the 10 or 50 year total water level, adding to what FEMA provides with the 1% annual chance flood. So far, we have results for about 15% of the domain and partners are initially using the findings for port, transportation and water infrastructure planning municipal and county climate adaptation planning and with tribal partners we're evaluating novel mitigation strategy strategies that cultural and green solutions like clam gardens might provide um, for both food production and buffering the impacts to shores above for the larger river systems we're envisioning a compound flood model like we've developed for the Nooksack and the Squally rivers using Delft 3D flexible mesh with the same boundary conditions and accounting for spatially varying land cover and friction effects. Our error is less than about a foot in the rivers and floodplains. And this 2020 Super Bowl flood shows the vulnerability of nationally important agricultural areas, salmon habitats, and proposed restoration actions uh, to sea level rise as tides today are observed to backwater stream flow. We're really excited that model assessments of the proposed habitat restoration show potential to reduce flood stage by two feet today during these large events and up to nearly uh, one foot under projected sea level rise and higher peaks stream floods through the year 2080 perhaps buying time for communities to better plan for resilience and garner support for greener flood mitigation strategies today. I like John's diagram too, though. That was good. <laughs> so <clears throat> apologies, we missed a couple of your slides because apparently I clicked off of it and went on there. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, if it's okay with you, Eric, I'm going to just go ahead and show the next slide, but I just apologies on that. But if you want, you can always go online and watch what the little bit that you missed on Eric's slide and then definitely ask him any questions or I'm happy to pull his, his uh, video and kind of freeze it while we do some questions. Um, I think I have one more. Let's see. What am I now? I've lost so. Um, there it is. I'm going to go with one more from UCLA. Um, here, I'll try not to mess it up this time. 
Hi, my name is Bo Xiangtang, and I also go by Burson. Currently, I'm a PhD candidate from UCLA Coastal Flood Lab. My research focuses on quantitative urban coastal flood modeling and assessment. Today, I'm going to talk about a case study of coastal compound flood modeling in Sunset Beach, California. Coastal flooding is a widely recognized hazard, which can be exacerbated by interactions among marine and hydrologic forcing, known as compound flooding. Compound flooding at low-lying urban coastal region can be highly complicated because on the ocean side, the water goes up with, with tide, sea level rise, and El Nino. Um, besides, we have wave goes on top of it. That water can get in by wave overtopping. On the inland side, we have direct precipitation. Upstream fluvial discharge can elevate estuary or embayment water level. That water can overflow and cause flooding too. And these flood pathways are often naturally correlated. Like in Southern California, we have big tide in winter times, and that's when we have precipitation. Um, besides, coastal management also plays an important role. Like rising the seawall can help can help defend tidal overflow, but it can also retain more water from other flood pathways like precipitation or overtopping. The storm sewer can drain storm water, but embayment water can also backflow during high tide. So in order to properly characterize site-specific exposure to flood hazard, consideration of compound effects and high-resolution topographic data is essential. And currently, an integrated framework considering this stuff in urban coastal flood modeling does not exist. The Sunset Beach is one of the typical urban coastal regions. And in the last decade, this area has experienced multiple floods from different flood pathways. There were high tide, heavy precipitation, energetic wave, or the core occurrence of these events. And the situation is only getting worse with future sea level rise. Hydrodynamic model with flexible mesh, Delta 3D FM was adopted to model the compound flooding. A historical flood event caused by tide, tide overflow is reconstructed for validation purpose. Um, flood accent was identified from photos and measured with RTK unit. The comparison indicates that the model results match the measurement reasonably well. And here is an example demonstrating the importance of considering the compound effects. During high tide, the drainage system will be closed to avoid backflow of ocean water. And storm water from normal precipitation event can then be problematic. On the right top is a photo showing people have to pump the storm water out since the drainage system valves were closed. Here, the annual high tide and precipitation with two-year return period are considered. Both are harmless by themselves. Our results show that the core occurrence of the peak precipitation and high tide, the scenario A, um, results the widest flood accident and the highest maximum inundation depth. The two-hour lead of water level peak does not change the simulated flood impact that much. But if the peak precipitation arrives two hours later, the produced flood accident and the maximum inundation depth decreased considerably. This shows that the compound effects of these factors can significantly influence the modeling results and deserves further investigation. The research is funded by UCLA Coastal Flood Lab and other institutions. Thank you for watching. All right, those were great, I thought. Um, let me see, I'm gonna see. Laura, what are we doing here? Is there time for questions? There absolutely is time for questions. Yep. Would folks like to um, offer any comment on the, any questions via the chat? Yep. 
uh, please add some of the chat. I've got some in the meantime, um, if you guys can. Oh, hear. okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, please. Um, so Thank this you. first one, yeah, this first one's uh, fear for you. Um, you, <laughs> yours was a fabulous example of the importance of, of the notable threats to critical infrastructure. And I'm wondering, um, have the projections um, using this model been passed along to the Navy? And I was I was absolutely noting how you know in your in your color coding some of those some of those are red. So if you pass it along, and what's the reaction and and any comments from them on what they might do? A great question. Uh, definitely something that is going to be happening. Uh, John Mara could actually speak to whether or not he has shared any of it yet. We're, uh, we're, we're developing a, a whole suite of products uh, based upon the likelihood of kind of flood issues in today's climate and future climates and under multiple sea level rise. And so uh, John's still wondering when I'm gonna give him the, the remainder of that data, but uh, he hopefully soon will be uh, providing that information to the, uh, to the Navy. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So we have, we've done some initial briefings and there you're right, they're very interested in stuff like that because they wanna know, for example, what what's going to happen first and what do they need to be able to um, prepare but, and we're going to provide a more extensive briefing this fall. Thanks. Excellent. Um, Peter, we've got another one uh, in the chat. Um, you mentioned a 500 year event. How did you develop this from the much shorter available data? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and I think John in his opening remarks did a, a better job of providing the context uh, to the approach than I did when I kind of quickly went through the details. But we're basically developing a simulation approach such that we can actually generate any number of combinations of the drivers of total water levels uh, synthetically using Monte Carlo techniques. And so we're just sampling from distributions that are the joint probabilities are, are taken care of. And so we developed 500 year time series we keep track of the um, annual uh, maximum and using the count back method, we can, the fifth biggest event within a 500 year time series is the 100 year event. And so we actually, uh, by doing this over and over again, we can determine the very many different number of combinations of the individual drivers that can produce these extremes. And so it becomes important when you're actually looking at the impacts um, because the, the different drivers are gonna cause different impacts. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, I've got, do, do, do. Okay, Mark, um, that's a good one. Compound effects could also land, uh, I'm sorry, could include land cover changes. Um, good example, post-fire effects with extreme uh, storm rainfall. What if any utility in integrated model development would be served in examining the experience of uh, the Montecito debris flow um, which was good, good point, a really important recent extreme coastal flooding event. That's, that could be, that's open up to everyone. Any, uh, let's see, Eric, Peter, want to weigh in on that at all? I would just say it's, it's going to be needed. Um, mm -hmm. Up in the Northwest, we've published some papers that explore how sediment delivery down rivers are likely to change in the future. And we think we're already seeing some signs of appreciable aggradation of the tidally influenced areas of rivers mm -hmm. such that um, they continue to play you know, a, a major role on flood risk and flow conveyance. And there's also some new work showing some um, sort of decadal scale, maybe PDO related um, sort of flow of larger coarsal coarser gravel lags coming down through reaches on the order of a few kilometers. And so they set up, you know, an aggregated bed for maybe a few decades for flood managers to deal with and then slowly sort of dissipate. Um, so hugely important, but trying to get the flooding right first. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's see, do we, have, do we have time for one last question, Laura? I think we can do one last question. I don't know, um, Timu, is Timu on? Timu, are you there for person? No, I think she might be, she might have to teach today. Okay. Um, so I've got, I've got just one quick question, last one for Eric. Um, the adaptation uses with yours are, are terrific. Um, 
I just wanted to see if you could please speak a little bit um, more about stakeholder outreach and reaction because it's some of those ideas are just fabulous. I'd love to hear more about their feedback on this. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting lessons learned up in the Northwest is that the tribes have been really driving a lot of adaptation concerns and initial scoping and planning. And a number of the state and county agencies are actually looking to a few of these tribes uh, for guidance because they've really pushed ahead. And they're the ones who are thinking much more holistically about food production, for example, um, with ways of maybe mitigating some of these coastal impacts we're talking about. Um, and really, I, don't know, I, I just think they're, they're, they're thinking more sort of in an integrated way. Um, and we've been essentially adapting some of our modeling of the impacts to other sectors of concern. So the ecosystem restoration community is trying to restore large areas of marsh and eelgrass, for example, but our status quo approaches for flood protection are um, having major disturbance to those systems and limiting the recovery of salmon in, in many key locations. So it's all coming together like um, I think John mentioned and Peter has mentioned and several others. Great. Great. Thank you guys. So we're gonna go, looks like, uh, sorry, just, just posted on Tweet, who's in our next panel as I was trying to find him in the in the chat, make sure he was here. Um, but thanks everybody for those great videos. And we're gonna go ahead and um, have Ian kick off our next panel while I spotlight the rest of our panelists. And I think um, Adam will be first. So I'll try and find him as well. Um, okay. Let's see. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so my name is Ian Miller. I'm with the Washington Sea Grant Program and uh, coming at you from the land of the Sklalem people um, on uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca in Washington State. And this panel is uh, called Bridging the Gap to Serve Communities. And our intent with this panel is to provide you all with hopefully novel perspectives about how flooding related information is integrated into community conversations and planning and how coastal flooding is understood by people that we sometimes abstractly refer to as stakeholders and all with the hope of encouraging and enhancing uh, your community engagement efforts. Um, to help us with this today, we have four panelists who will be making three presentations and I'm just extraordinarily honored to uh, provide a brief introduction to these um, panelists because it's a pretty uh, phenomenal group. Our first speaker and presentation will be from Adam Cantor. Um, and uh, Adam is a natural resources specialist for the Wiat tribe, which is a federally recognized tribe with ancestral lands in and around present day Northern California. Our second speaker will be Ann grodnick Nagel. And Anne is a, a climate policy advisor for Seattle Public Utilities and is one of the driving forces behind the creation of a Seattle Resilience District, which is an urban planning innovation recently funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And then our third presentation will feature two panelists. Dr. Anshui Akom is a co-founder of Streetwise, um, which is a mobile mapping and engagement platform that facilitates the collection and sharing of community generated data. And also the founding director of UC San Francisco and San Francisco State University's Social Innovation and Universal Opportunity Lab or the Soul Lab. And then Dr. Ekta Shah is also a co-founder of Streetwise and is a postdoctoral fellow in data science, health tech and human centered design at the Soul Lab. So again, a pretty phenomenal a group of panelists. Um, each of our three presentations will last a roughly eight minutes in length or so, and we'll have time at the end for, um, for our panelists to address questions that, that you provide via chat. Um, note that unlike the previous panels, our panelists will be pre presenting live. So please be patient as we exchange the screen share between speakers and uh, go through that whole process. 
Uh, but with that, I'm, I'm pleased to hand it over to our first speaker, uh, Adam Cantor from uh, the We Out Tribe. Thanks, Adam. How about though, can you all see my screen? Yep. Awesome, I'm in presenter mode. <laughs> yes. Yep, all right, good. you're good to go. I want low uh, greetings from we got ancestral territory here on Table Bluff in the Wiggy, uh, which is Humboldt Bay. And I heard a lot about tribes taking the charge uh, along the West Coast to really, you know, begin, you know, driving these scoping and vulnerability and adaptation um, efforts. And we're looking at a picture of Tutalot Island in the center of Humboldt Bay at a, at a king tide. And so you can only imagine, you know, what this scene would look like, um, you know, after an atmospheric river and with huge wind waves. And this is the cultural center for the Weyot tribe and where they have their um, world renewal ceremony. Uh, we're located on the Eureka Littoral Cell of Humboldt Bay, the Lower Eel and Mad Rivers. And what's interesting about us, we're right near the, the Mendocino Triple Junction and uh, the Cascadia Subduction Zone. And Humboldt Bay actually has the highest rate of sea level rise on the, the West Coast having risen over um, 18 inches in the last century with you know, many WIAT sites um, at very low elevations. Um, as I said, the, the WIAT um, have a long cultural history both along the dunes and the bay shore and um, really depend on these to continue um, their cultural legacy. And a lot of the work that you all are doing is preparing folks like us to, to prepare the next generation of tribal folks to best manage their resources for future generations. And as part of you know, our initial kind of BIA scoping efforts to begin our climate change and sea level rise adaptation program, we've been looking at existing uh, sea level rise viewers and, and data sources. Um, and one thing that that came out, um, the NOAA viewer here looking at, at the Lower Eel and, and Humboldt Bay, is we were excited to hear about the cosmos uh, coming to the North Coast, but we're sort of surprised that apparently modeling uh, interbay and, and bay waves is a little bit more challenging than just the outer coast. And so that's kind of something that, that we're hoping that we can maybe work with you guys to start thinking about. And you know, some of our shorelines on Humboldt Bay are, are really vulnerable to, to erosion and overtopping um, with about 90% of the bay um, shoreline kind of being diked and modified, which makes it um, increasingly vulnerable. This is looking from uh, Table Bluff on the South, South Bay, South Humboldt Bay. And so one question we have is, um, what are the, the risks and rate of potential erosion um, that the bluff could face under sea level rise combined with um, you know, large rain on snow events, atmospheric rivers? And apparently no one is really looking at, at this right now. Um, but a lot of the anthropogenic um, changes to the bay have really influenced erosion. This is a significant site um, at the entrance of Humboldt Bay, which has, uh, after they, they diked or they, they created the jetties to, to expand the bay entrance and make it more safe for vessels, uh, contributed to almost a quarter mile of erosion of um, a significant bluff uh, right at the entrance, which is also happens to be um, a nuclear waste a storage site that's only 150 feet from the bay. Um, well, of course, lots of concerns here and, and kind of a challenging, a challenging place, I would think, to model. I'm no modeler. Uh, other issues on the bay are contaminated sites, um, uh, legacy industrial sites, uh, you know, here looking at, at, um, at some sites that will be in, impacted by sea level rise. All of this has kind of, you know, led us to focus more on upland resources uh, like, like this hazelnut stand which will be more resilient as opposed to this one, the Elk River Estuary, which is kind of right at sea level and you know, will be impacted. Uh, tribes are kind of taking a role. Uh, um, we've heard a lot about traditional ecological knowledge um, uh, in sea level rise and climate change initiatives. And right now that we are, are just kind of launching such an effort, but there's lots of questions here. You know, there's lots of kind of 
folks that are, are finally reaching out for tribal input and tribal knowledge, but um, there's a respectful way to do that. Um, there's proprietary knowledge, um, you know, of course, involved, and, and this all has to be thought of uh, diligently um, so that we can, we can help plan for future generations. Um, some of the successful sources that we've been able to get for funding to really start this effort, um, the BIA, uh, PG&E, and Ocean Protection Council, uh, Prop 68. And so just excited to begin launching these efforts and to learn more for you guys. And thanks for uh, inviting me to be here today. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, so again, uh, we'll be doing questions via the chat and, and primarily at the end. So uh, without uh, any further ado, we'll move on to uh, our next speaker, Anne Grodnick Nagel. Um, and Anne, again, is uh, the Climate Policy Advisor for Seattle Public Utilities. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for having me. Here I am uh, with my slides and my voice. Um, thanks for that, Adam. It was great to hear what uh, the WIA is doing and to note some uh, overlap between our efforts. So as Ian mentioned, I um, am the Climate Policy Advisor at Seattle Public Utilities. Um, SPU is a department of the city of Seattle. Um, we are comprised of three utilities. We provide drinking water to the entire city of Seattle drainage and wastewater services, and also solid waste management. Um, since our lines of business are directly impacted by and contribute to climate change, you know, we are on the front lines of the adaptation conversation in Seattle. And Seattle doesn't really have one department that handles adaptation. So um, as water managers, we're kind of put uh, in, in a position of thinking a lot about um, how to integrate this into planning. And you know our our water management work touches water supply during times of drought, drainage issues um, in neighborhoods, some of which do not have formal drainage um, infrastructure, even within the city. Planning for and investing in improvements in our drainage system with changing weather. And I think we're not seeing your slide. We're just seeing. Oh no, I'm not proceeding. You're not presenting or what we're seeing it's, is not. Uh, yeah, appears not to be uh, in presentation mode. Sorry about uh -huh. that. Perfect. There we go, yeah, great. Okay, so let me just zip through and um, on our shorelines, you know, adaptation planning, um, incorporating sea level rise and storm surge. So today I'm gonna zoom in to um, work that the city is um, undertaking in partnership with community in South Seattle in the Duwamish Valley. Uh, can you see my cursor? We're gonna be talking about the yep. neighborhood of South Park and across the Duwamish River, the neighborhood of Georgetown. South Park in, in, is a microcosm for how um, climate impacts, the, the disparities of climate impacts and, uh, sorry, just a minute, I'm having some other challenges with my presentation, really sorry about this. Um, South Park stands out as a hub for our Latinx community. It's the ancestral home of the Duwamish people. Um, and it's also, um, uh, the home of people facing high risk of displacement and low access to economic and educational opportunity. Um, it's a place where the impacts of historic environmental injustice are concentrated. Um, it's bordered by the Duwamish River Superfund site to the east, industrial areas to the north, and highways to the, to the west, um, and another highway kind of dividing the neighborhood. So cumulative impacts of these features have resulted in high rates of asthma, lower life expectancy, high crime rates, and many other health and public safety concerns. The Duwamish Mick is the industrial area that is just abuts the, this neighborhood. It's an extremely productive area, um, industrial area in a city that has, uh, where that is becoming increasingly rare. 
So this is just uh, looking from the northernmost part of the Duwamish Valley up to downtown Seattle. You can see Harbor Island on the left here and Elliott Bay out here. The intersection between priorities in this area really um, is a result of this kind of industrial area neighbored by a residential area. People use the Duwamish for, um, uh, has strong cultural traditions, recreational opportunities, and is, has extensive salmonid habitat for five species of fish. This is uh, just a sense of the Duwamish, what it was in the mid 1800s and what it looks like today. In the early 1900s, it was shortened, straightened um, and deepened to make it a navigable waterway. And South Park, the area we are talking about is right here. So really no surprise when you look at the, the former path of the meandering river and the straightened path of the waterway today that this area has severe flooding problems today because it is built on former mudflats and floodplains. So current flooding in this area um, results from several factors. Um, we have um, basin surcharges, so stormwater surcharges when the outfall gate uh, is closed during to, uh, large storm events. There's just limited drainage infrastructure in the area. The water overtops the banks. It's very flat and it's, it's low. It's with portions of the, of the basin really located within the, the floodplain. SPU is investing heavily in drainage infrastructure in this area in the coming years, um, but it's all intended to manage stormwater, not at all meant to address um, tidal flooding so, and that will, is becoming worse with sea level rise. So here are just some photos of the type of flooding that we're seeing in this area today um, from both stormwater and anywhere from two to six days of sunny day flooding that results from water overtopping the banks. These are the, this is SPU stormwater drainage basin in the area and you can see water flows down towards this basin here and the red outline it, uh, shows where we are investing in road improvements, conveyance, our first ever pump station um, and a stormwater quality facility. The neighborhood, the residential neighborhood of South Park is right here alongside the industrial area. So this is a kind of an example of the type of data that we share with um, community um, in an effort to start planning for sea level rise. Um, we're looking at a, approximately a foot of sea level rise by mid-century and three feet. We're planning for three feet of sea level rise by the end of the century. And when combined with um, monthly and annual high tides and storm surge, um, we start to see a picture of um, repetitive losses and inundation, particularly in the industrial area. And this is really hard. These conversations are very challenging to have, uh, particularly when you get down to the parcel level. And um, it's, it's tough, not only because of the obvious impacts on people's lives and livelihoods, um, but also because this is a yet another looming challenge for a community that is facing um, uh, pressures of displacement and health inequity today. So uh, the city has uh, endeavored on establishing a resilience district in this area in partnership with the community. Um, we've been really lucky to uh, be awarded a grant to complete this work uh, or actually to initiate this work. And the idea is that this is a place-based district that will focus on adaptation to sea level rise um, and other climate impacts while also taking a comprehensive approach that fosters community resilience. Because as we are learning time and time again, community resilience um, is about more than just infrastructure. It's about access to living wage jobs. It's about access to affordable housing. And so really trying to take that as a holistic um, challenge and solve that in partnership with community in a way that can actually um, build wealth in the community um, in, instead of increasing displacement pressure alongside our, the improvements that we're making. So this is just a little bit more on the resilience district approach. Um, in terms of data and the modeling that we are using for this, Seattle is, I mean, the city is lucky to be a very, you know, kind of data rich place. Um, I'm really looking forward to the, the Cosmos modeling that um, is coming, that was just discussed in the previous session. And 
Additionally, some groundwater monitoring, monitoring that, that uh, King County will be leading in the Duwamish Valley. Um, but I would say a lot of the challenges we have around um, data uh, come from overlaying some of the uh, modeling with um, uh, community needs and critical assets and starting to communicate that in a way that means something to the people who live and work in this place um, and kind of goes beyond colors um, or gradations on a map. So I'll leave it there and pass it on. Great, thank you, Anne. That's a great point to end on too. Um, so again, uh, questions uh, at the end we'll address via chat. Um, and I'm pleased to uh, hand the mic per se over to our uh, third uh, set of speakers and presentation, uh, Dr. Anshvia Combe, again, co-founder of Streetwise with Dr. Ekta Shah. Do have a couple in the chat, so I'm just going to sort of I'm, I'm going to rip into them. The first one that came in was for Adam, um, and Adam, uh, can you describe the types of documentation of historic flooding? Uh, so how much and where might exist uh, that could help guide, um, you know, the, uh, what factors lead to flooding in the areas that uh, you know you focus on and that the tribe cares about. Thank you for that question. Um, this topic just came up, and of course, um, you know everyone has memories of historic floods in recent time. Uh, Two thousand five New Year's storm was a big one here, and so one thing that we're hoping to do is is kind of go back um, in more recent time and and get just you know personal recollections of recent flooding, the locations, uh, you know where. You know, roads were closed, US Highway 101 was closed, um, and kind of use that to prioritize, you know, identifying, you know, adaptation, uh, you know, where we want to prioritize identifying adaptation strategies um, moving forward. Um, I don't know if I answered the question. But <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Laura, I think that was your question. Do you want to uh, tag on a follow on real quick? Oh, that was pretty much what I was looking for is just like within the community is there some whether it's either you know, either even just uh, oral documents um, documents and stories about flooding versus what's written down that would um, if researchers were to come into your community would they you know we might be able to pinpoint like certain dates and years to kind of think about what whether that was an El Nino season or whether there were specific uh, wind and wave conditions that we could help kind of um, start piecing out what are the specific conditions that uh, might cause flooding in that bay. So thank you. Thank you. And then we do have a, a great flood story like like many cultures around the world. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so the next question that came in is, is for Anne, just to go in an order. Um, does the resilience district incorporate additional climate change vulnerabilities aside from sea level rise? Uh, yeah, the the resilience district is it hinges on um, flood management, and the reason for that is because SPU is making over a hundred million dollar investment in stormwater management in the area, and we saw it as an opportunity to leverage that um, that oper that investment and and kind of design for challenges today um, and challenges tomorrow. So the so sea level rise adaptation and current and stormwater flood management are really the driving um, uh, issues behind it, but the solutions that we're seeking are multi-benefit and we'll, um, we expect to see uh, improvements, you know, in terms of air quality and heat management as well. Very cool, thank you. So there's a lot coming in. I see that there's some already being addressed and answered in the chat. Um, so I apologize if any of these get repeated, but I think the next one's regardless worth talking about. So Anshui, 
um, there's a question about your comment about the use of the term citizen science. Um, and it's, it's kind of a long question, but uh, the, um, the question is, you know, this term is still used quite broadly and innocuously since, uh, you know, it's simply the definition of citizen as being someone living or occupying in a particular place. Um, you know, and the question is, has this term been an impediment to community involvement in science in your view? Um, yeah, I, I think, I think, thank you for the question. I think um, the term language is all about interpretation and there's a relationship between words, speech and power. And so I think doing really fantastic community engagement is about building trust. And what we've seen is that Yes, when you use the term citizen science and folks, that's a triggering word, depending on where you're coming from and your own lived experience. Uh, so we avoid using that, that term. You know, community science is, is much more effective, right, than citizen science, you know, just, you know, resident science, bottom up innovation. I mean, there's a million different ways to talk about doing that kind of work rather than calling it citizen science. Um, so we really focus on um, building power, building self-determination, using language that is affirming and not filled with any kind of micro insults, micro aggressions, or you know, any way that would oppress another human being. And I think that level, I think really for all of us, but certainly for Streetwise, and we can only speak for ourselves, is that level of intentionality that the process, the streetwise process, the research justice, racial justice, social justice process and methodology is actually more important than the platform. If you really want to do great science on the ground with communities that have been historically traumatized by universities, by institutions, by cities, from the positionality that many of us sit in, then you have to be willing to flip the script and let those people lead the way and practice cultural humility. So that's what we've seen in our own work. Fantastic. Um, we had a question come in from Trent uh, Dillon. And Trent, I'm wondering if you do want to uh, turn your mic on and ask the question, since, as you point out, it is a long one and, and with some complexities. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I, I appreciate it. Uh, for context, I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. Uh, this is a question for everyone. Um, I'm in the early stages of a research collaboration uh, with a local ocean coastal indigenous community. Uh, the tribe isn't observing immediately threatening sea level rise, but is concerned about the threat of a Cascadia tsunami event. Uh, much of their critical infrastructure and about 60% of homes are inside the inund inundation zone, uh, but they've had difficulty relocating due to freshwater distribution limitations. Uh, and we're hoping to improve their coastal resilience through renewal, renewable power desalination. Um, I, again, I'm in the very early stages of this. I'm just curious what, what some of the questions, opportunities, constraints, priorities, uh, you'd recommend centering at this at, at this time in the in, in in the project. So I'll, I'll let maybe any of you jump in that want to take on any part of that project. Adam, maybe uh, would you perhaps be willing to start, given your position within a within a coastal tribe? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to take that. I mean, one one kind of recent application is there's um, there's the um, the permitting for a um, a land based aqua farms project on Samoa Peninsula, which um, there's many tribal concerns about um, uh, fish escape from this facility in the event of let's say a tsunami. And the company was kind of modeling for like a one in 1500 year event or something like that. And, um, you know, it's been a big concern of the tribes, um, you know, uh, what could a tsunami do to this facility? Could it cause fish escape? What implications could that have for native salmonid species? Um, so I sort of missed the beginning of the tsunami question, but I think it's a, a real concern that we need to be looking at and thinking of when we're modeling um, coastal climate uh, change, um, sea level rise and, and vulnerability. 
Antwi or Anne, either of you want to add to that? And I'd be, I'm not to put you on the spot, but I'd be curious, based on your familiarity with SPU, if you had any thought about the uh, the fresh water the freshwater distribution limitations. That's an area that's kind of a little outside of my research, and I'm I'm wondering if there's like what are the first questions that you would ask if you were entered in, into this type of environment or situation? I you are putting me on the spot. It's a tough one. I don't um, I don't know. I I have to think about it. I have to think about it and I'd be happy to talk about it offline. Maybe I, I think more thoughts would come to mind if I were not in front of 150 people, you know? Okay, great. Yeah, maybe I'll send you an email. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Great, thank you. So uh, Antwi, the next question, uh, at least there's a lot of them and this is the next one at least that's in front of me in the, in the chat, but it's one that came to mind for me as well. Can you describe um, any experiences or successes that you've had with using Streetwise in particular um, to understand the impacts of flooding uh, in the communities where it's deployed. Yeah, uh, Ekta, do you want to take this if you're on or do you want me to take it? Just. Yeah, sure, happy to um, put some in the chat as well just in case we ran out of time, but um, thanks for the question. Um, just to outline quickly, some of the work we did in New York, New Jersey, um, actually working with community members to to crowdsource some of the the places that flood waters were coming in from from the the water bodies that surround the city um, to identify the best place to do a community led wetlands project. Um, they were able to actually raise the funds and put in the infrastructure for a pretty relatively small, you know, maybe a block of of wetlands um, that when there were floods. Um, that that wetland area actually protected a large swath of the community and you actually saw that the other areas that didn't have the wetlands were severely flooded um, but the one that had that crowdsourced sort of wetland protection um, remained protected um, and then we also did some work in richmond california and the communities there actually identified um, really important critical community assets um, so either public spaces, churches, libraries that are actually cross-functional, um, it might serve as food distribution sites and or childcare or even health clinics that were particularly vulnerable to flooding in that Richmond neighborhood um, and actually were able to use community data to make a case to fund infrastructure to support those um, community assets. So that they would be protected from flooding because they serve such an important community need. I would just quickly um, say that in the Richmond work, we worked with Methune, uh, and I don't know if you know Methune, but one of their bases is in Washington. And so, you know, I had some slides on that. We just didn't have the time for it. But Laura, to your point, that was creating marshlands. That was we were part of the home team for resiliency by design. Um, so that was also um, creating pedestrian pathways and bike pathways um, and also affordable housing. And I think for us, we really try to bring that community vision and community power across those social determinants of health. I think Anne really said it best. You know, it's not, it's not just about the, the flooding or the sea level rise. Uh, we are also recently were invited into conversation with CMG and some other uh, architecture firms around the $5 billion San Francisco waterfront. So there, that's a huge project. Um, they're very concerned about sea level rise in the business district of San Francisco, and they wanna figure out what's the way to get community voice and community input into that conversation. So those are some of the kinds of conversations um, that Streetwise is in, but we don't just work with big firms. I wanna make sure that we say that, you know, we're totally bottom up. We totally love working with not only community-based and grassroots organizations, but just regular everyday people. So thank you for the question, Laura. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna use my moderator's prerogative to introduce sort of my own question here. Um, and I'd love to hear from each of you actually, if, if I could. Um, so my question is, is for the communities that you, you know, live in, work in, or serve, um, can you give us a sense for where uh, coastal flooding sits as a priority within those community? Where, where does it sit sort of in regards to the other pressures and stressors that that those people or communities uh, feel. 
and maybe we'll just uh, maybe Adam, you can go first. We'll go in the order of the presentations. I think in in Humboldt Bay, um, because so much of the transportation corridors are right on the estuarine fringe and are behind dikes, um, you know, uh, it might be more in people's minds than than maybe other communities, and in particular. Um, the county of Humboldt has began to look at the Eureka Arcata safety corridor um, uh, along Humboldt Bay, which uh, is, is very low elevation. And, you know, most many people commute on that every day. And so it kind of has it, you know, I think, you know, in, in, in front view for most people here. Um, you know, it's a concern for the tribe because we're, we're isolated. We're sort of a food desert and healthcare desert. Um, that is, you know, during during storm events can can be isolated from the cities of, of Eureka. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's it's up there. But at the same time, um, you know, rather than than talking about you know you know moving Highway 101 inland to higher elevation, we're kind of you know wasting time figuring out how to just deal with it where it is by looking at you know nature based. Um, um you know armoring and starting to think about those kinds of things for a lot of the community thinks well we should be looking further ahead and and not wasting you know millions of dollars trying to you know stop a moving train thank you Anne. yeah i would say um it depends you know on what type of um flooding we're talking about you know we had two big storms this past winter, one in December, one in January, and the emergent flooding that happened for people in the streets where there were sandbags and they were trying to get in touch with SPU and they couldn't get someone on the phone. That was that was like immediately number one priority must solve this with neighbors at 2 a.m. You know, and and that actually is tied to now an ongoing conversation between the utility and our community partners around trust building. Like if we can't get you when it's our houses, our basements are flooding at two in the morning, how should, how do we know that you were really in this resilience district process as partners, you know? And, and I think that ties to like the longer term challenge of sea level rise and that vulnerability, I think is much lower on, on the the list of people's concerns and that's only because you know this neighborhood that i focused on today really is on the precipice of massive change you know the the rivers being cleaned up the their drainage is being put in their investments happening in the community center and in expanding parks and you can just see how i show you saw how close that neighborhood is to downtown it's super accessible and the river is lovely um you know and so you can see how those displacement pressures and those immediate challenges of living wage jobs and affordable housing um, kind of in the near term when it's not a crisis, those are for sure gonna outweigh any conversations around sea level rise um, at this point, but they're tied together. And I think people get that and they get that connection, but it's it's just a question of wh how, what problem am I gonna solve? What, what problem do I have the bandwidth to solve now? Yeah, I would, I would agree. You know, I think, um, I think it depends on the community and I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs is appropriate, you know? So I think, you know, people are worried about their physiological needs. Um, sometimes that's water, but sometimes what we've seen during COVID is people were starving, you know? So it was food, people wanted food. You know, a lot of communities, it was food. Um, other communities, it's housing. I mean, you can look around Seattle or look around San Francisco or Oakland where I'm based and, you know, you see tents everywhere, you know, so that's the main concern for the, for that group of people, right? So I, I, what I really appreciate about your question, Ian, is the question, you know, that we, and the process that we need to ask people, what are their main concerns? And at the same time, we need to be proactive to cover folks who may not be thinking of something that's about to slam us all. Right. And I think that's that's the art and the science of the work that all of us are doing together. I appreciate the question. Thank you. I also want to give a chance for Aikta to, to chime in. I think um, she had to drop because we, we, drop. we had a two. We were supposed to be off of this at 215, not pushing anyone.
Got it. Uh, well, so <laughs> I also, to to I also want, I wanted to acknowledge that I ran us over. I was, I was just excited about the conversation and hearing all of your perspectives, but um, I do need to draw it to a, conc a conclusion. So I wanted to thank uh, each of you for taking the time to join us today and presenting and providing your thoughts, um, really insightful. And um, if there was a way we could clap, we would be doing so. Um, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Laura. Hey, I wanted to point out as well that I saw in the chat, there was a lot of sort of like um, networking happening as well. All of these, uh, um, uh, the panelists are easily sort of findable online. Um, if you're looking to get in contact with them about their projects or tools or what have you. So thank you. Awesome. I think Tessa might be still on for the Streetwise folks just for a few more minutes. So um, Tessa, please extend our fabulous gratitude to them for taking the time today out of their very, very busy schedules. And to Anne and Adam, similarly, I know you all have a lot on your plates to these days and um, your stories and perspectives were just extremely valuable to hear. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of interest in talking with you a bit more. So we probably could have gone for the whole half day, um, but I appreciate the time that you guys got. And um, and uh, it's really exciting to see how you're reaching how you're reaching out with these communities and really actually being able to involve them in in the discussions um, and in the vision for their coastal future is how I always put it. It's their it's their coast. It's their vision. Like we should respect that and, and give them the space to, to envision what they want and what they need. So thank you very much. Um, all right, so with that, I was just gonna uh, talk a little bit about some of the big thoughts that we heard today and go over um, what the day two agenda is with everybody um, and um, so let me just actually do that uh, really fast. If I can pull it up. All right, you see that? So uh, so Dick, tomorrow's day two agenda, we'll have another panel um, moderated by Ben Hamlington, um, which I'm excited to talk about the RISE project, which was mentioned briefly by our keynote speakers and um, a number of different other collaboration activities. And then we really, really would love your feedback in the working group session. So if you can make it, they'll be from 10.30 to 11.30 tomorrow. And then we'll be some doing some reporting out and talking um, about next steps. And with that, um, I wanted to also, I don't know, bring Roxanne to the top here. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, yes, wow. so, really big now. <laughs> Roxanne's been helping take some notes on big themes in the background. I've been adding to them, but she actually did a really good job of pulling out a couple of um, couple of key ones that we heard today. So, I mean, I'll kick us off by saying, and I invite any of Roxanne and any of the other committee members to um, know any uh, any th big themes they heard today, but. Um, you know, one of them for me was from the keynote speakers, both from Carl, who I think is still on, and um, from uh, Nicole, there was a lot of really strong interest in, um, in recognizing that the feedback loop between understanding um, what our, our flooding risks are sort of at the moment in the model, but then also continuing to look at these changing conditions. So why the observations are so critical to understanding how things are changing on the ground and how we can kind of provide that feedback loop. And also again, work with our communities to understand how things are changing, whether it's man-managed structures and nourishment or elevation elevations or Again, um, you know, people experiencing not being able to get access to their emergency services or losing housing and all these things are really important. So um, not just the physical observations, but the actual socioeconomic and cultural observations as well. Um, so I was excited to hear that there was so much enthusiasm about how these are critical components for us. Um, for us as a big community of practice going forward to continue to work to integrate and um, collaborate on. And um, so, yeah, in uh, Nicole's words, I'd like to shoot ahead of the duck <laughs> and figure out how we can how we can do that. Roxanne? Um, yeah, that was great, Laura. I think that um, some of the other things that I pulled out um, now that I'm I'm 
interpreting my own notes through our last presentations was that the um, theme of adapting our methods to the place that you're in. And that comes from like the modeling side of things of adapting your um, near shore morphology to the West Coast specific and the equations that are best to use for, for different conditions um, in different places. And then also with our communities of what they need um, and what they, what they bring to the table that, and finding, um, adapting our methodology and, and being open to new ideas about that to incorporate that information. Um, I think I'll just leave it there. I liked that one. <laughs> uh, Peter, John, Ian, any other thoughts that you want to add? Mark? Oh, my talkers are quiet, Clarissa. <laughs> well, I think um, uh, I, I, I still feel like I'm very much digesting. And so uh, I'm hoping that I feel like I have a little bit more to contribute to the big ideas uh, page by tomorrow. Great. Uh, was one, of the, one of the things that came, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, John. I was going to say one of the things that came to me that just it seems like maybe we're going in that direction is just there's there's sort of a granularity issue in that we're doing a lot of cool stuff but we're not at necessarily it was a point that Ann made that, that we're, we're still doing colors on the map and we need to connect that down to what does that actually mean for folks and, and decisions so that was one of the things that I, I saw that kind of with this is reinforced thanks I was just going to say that um, I thought I knew what was happening on the West Coast and just getting um, exposed to so many different projects and what people are doing was just been terrific. And it, it also kind of raises the issue for me that there is a lot of information out there and it's going to keep, continue to grow in terms of what we're generating as scientists and researchers. And just how the public interacts with that is, I think, going to be a challenge and how do you start to how do you start to build a consensus about what you know what is a good product what is a good what are the data needs so that's something i i hope and i think that ocean visions can can wrestle with a bit is how do we start to um, address that particular issue okay yeah i look forward to the discussions tomorrow and on that note um we'd love to get a pretty good idea of how many of you guys are coming tomorrow so if you can go to that slido.com and punch in those numbers. You'll be asked to take a poll of whether you're coming tomorrow and any short, quick feedback from today um, would be very helpful for us, especially if you can't be there tomorrow, go ahead and just fill that out and give us any of your um, feedback of anything that resonated today or in particular that you wanna hear more about. Um, that would be really great for us in terms of the bigger ocean visions initiative. And I will keep that open. You're welcome to continue to use the chat if you want to ask any of our committee questions. Um, but with that, I will um, hopefully see most of you tomorrow. Well done, Laura. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Laura. Thank you. Good job.